right there. Thank you. August 3, 2017. October. October. There's nobody here. <laughs> October 3, 2017, at a meeting of the Board of Selectmen, and we want it, we have to remind everybody at the time that uh, this meeting is being recorded, so watch what you say. And we always start with a moment of, uh, of uh, appreciation for our troops that are serving around the world, but I think that today maybe we'll include the people in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas that, uh, that uh, hopefully things will change in our country. But if we could just have a moment. Thank you. Um, we got an appointment to start with the Park and Rec Commission. Chairman Mel Siebel, uh, Kevin Ryder, Director, to discuss the results of the programmatic needs study. Thank you. Thank you again for having us <coughs> here this morning. Uh, this, uh, excuse me. Wow, it's been a long time. <coughs> um, for the past three years, um, our department has seen tremendous, um, tremendous growth. Um, in the Park and Rec Department, um, despite operating out of the antiquated fact center. Uh, revenue generated from programs, camps, special events, and use of our playing fields has increased from $450,000 in FY14 to more than $715,000 this past year. Uh, it's a 60% increase in just, uh, net revenue. Uh, our summer camps have seen similar growth, going from 661 participants in 2014 to 1,187 this past summer. And that number would have been higher if you had a larger space. <clears throat> Registrations in all our programs has been on a rise during that same time from 4,500 in 2014 to 6,600 in 2016. What does this all mean? It means we are thriving despite limitations presented by the FAFSA. It means we are meeting the needs of a portion of the residents of this town of Bedford. We currently serve mainly toddlers to sixth graders the majority of our program. We have nothing for high school students and offer limited activities for middle school kids and adults and senior citizens. But the residents that do take our programs enjoy these programs immensely. It means we have outgrown our current residents and are ready to bring a new state-of-the-art park and recreation facility here to the town of Netflix. Um, I want to bring up Mel Siebel, our chairman. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a uh, background on where we've been with this project. After Mel, um, we have Rob Hunden and Michael Montgomery from Hunden Strategic Partners in Chicago um, for a little presentation for us. Thank you, Kevin. Good evening. Thank you for having us. The Parks and Recreation Commission is committed to our mission statement, and that is to provide affordable recreational opportunities for the residents of Medfield. Unfortunately, for well over a decade, we failed to fulfill this commitment because of a severe lack of indoor space. We're unable to offer activities and programs to, uh, to students, grades 7 through 12, to most seniors and most adults. Our existing programs are at capacity with waiting lists. We are precluded from offering new programs and activities because of this lack of indoor space. In 2008, the uh, Medfield Capital Planning and Finance Committee submitted a report to the Board of Selectmen, concurring with the 2001 committee, uh, their findings relative to the FAF Center. Inadequate building, asbestos, non-compliance of handicap accessibilities, a lack of a fire suppression system, PCBs, plumbing fixtures in need of replacement due to age, code requirements, efficiency, limited parking and traffic circulation. The committee concluded that the space that parks and rec operate out of is inadequate and is, quote, a real need that the town will have to address in the foreseeable future. That was nine years ago. The foreseeable future that that committee was uh, speaking of is here and it's today. Today our needs have increased exponentially. We had 6,600 participants uh, in our programs this past year. And as Kevin had mentioned, our, our revenue growth has been off the charts. Uh, the Commission believes that the uh, study that's been completed by 100 strategic partners justifies the construction of a new parks and recreation facility. We also believe that the pro forma that is included 
is extremely conservative and that yearly net revenue will be more than projected. As a result, we anticipate contributing substantially to the debt service that this facility would create. And that's unprecedented for a town department to contribute to the construction of their own building. Finally, we believe that Medfield has an obligation to provide access to quality recreational opportunities for all Medfield residents. A new facility will ensure that this goal is met. Parks and Recreation Services are often cited as one of the most important factors in surveys of how livable communities are. They provide identity for residents and are a major factor in the perception of the quality of life in the community. They're a tangible reflection of our community. And, uh, you know, we hope uh, with this presentation, this is a, uh, this is a, a serious, serious start for us. Um, we, we hired Hunden uh, last year. This is what they do. Um, we, an, we anticipate that uh, once the meetings we have with the Warren Committee, the Board of Selectmen, the Permanent Building Committee, that uh, all will be in concert in uh, agreeing that uh, the time is now for a new facility. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rob Hunded, Hunted Partners, Michael Montgomery. We're pleased to be here and we've been working on this project for about six months. We were here in the spring uh, kicking it off. And uh, we've some of this will be hard for you to read. I know we're under sort of a time constraint. So just to give you a sense of the number of slides and the number of minutes, we have 47 slides in about 20 minutes. So we're going to try to move quickly and give you the highlights. Uh, there's a much more robust study that was completed that um, Kevin King can uh, make you uh, can uh, pass out. Sorry. Um, so let me sort of start with the the overview. Make sure this is cool. Oh, there it's. Thank you, sir. Um, so let's go to the uh, key questions. So really, the purpose of this study was to understand, you know, just big picture. What is the feasibility? What is the demand? What's the opportunity? What's the current supply? We are in the business of figuring out supply versus demand, and, and uh, enough demand, and is our supply constrained enough to justify a new facility. And so we undertook this study and we looked at the FAF Center, what's the condition of the FAF Center, how is it, how is it performing, how is, how is this Parks and Rec Department doing within the facility, what are they able to offer. Um, what about outside the FAF Center? What do you have to do to um, have more <coughs> recreation in Medfield? Is that possible? Is there a gap there? Um, how does the Medfield community view this? We got um, a significant number of responses to a survey that was sent out um, that gave us a, quite a, a bit of good feedback about what folks really uh, want and need in their community. Um, and based on all that, is something recommended. So um, let's move to the next slide. I keep hitting the forward button as if I have the power here. Um, so the headlines are uh, that a new facility should be developed. And this is, a, this is sort of a perfect storm of several things. One, first I have to give kudos to the Parks and Recreation um, team. They are absolutely um, entrepreneurial and um, working hard to maximize a pretty inadequate situation. If you've been to the PATH Center, you understand that. We'll show you some photos if you haven't been recently. Um, so in a very decrepit old building, they are increasing their numbers and really sort of busting at the seams. Um, and they're, they're doing it in a, in a pretty profitable way. And we see a lot of parks and rec departments around the country, and most of them operate at a significant loss. But from a programmatic standpoint, um, these folks here are really you know, only taking on things that are going to generate some net operating profit, which means there's a need um, we don't use the word profit in the parks and rec space too often, but I think here it sort of supports this idea that this is a um, somewhat of a self-sustaining idea. So we've got an inadequate building, which is really in bad shape, Does, was not built for this use at all. It's sort of a makeshift deal, and we'll go into those details. Uh, and then you have this burgeoning demand. And the other thing that we'll show you, and if you're parents and you have one or more children, you're likely 
running around outside of Medfield during rush hour traffic or dinner, dinner time hours during the weekdays, spending most of your time not in Medfield going to and from different non-Medfield sports and rec facilities, whether they're outdoor or indoor, most of them are not here. And so we call that leakage in economic terms. Um, you all are spending time and money outside of Medfield instead of in your own community, and that takes away from your quality of life, and, and money is leaking out of the community. So, um, new project we do believe will benefit the Medfield community. You'll be able to have new and expanded enrichment programs. Uh, music, art, and drama are super popular, and those are really constructed right now. Um, everything really is constructed. You have columns in your existing spaces, so it's dangerous to do pretty much anything indoors at the FAF. Um, new and, and expanded adult fitness classes, indoor sports programs, basketball, volleyball, floor hockey, <coughs> indoor soccer, lacrosse, and football programs. There is a, a, there's a nationwide sort of burgeoning youth sports trend, and there's also just a burgeoning local um, trend of more activity and more organized activity, and you're just not able to capture and accommodate any of that. Um, practices and training for local and regional sports clubs, sports tournaments, which can be very impactful in terms of uh, weekend spending, uh, of people coming here and spending money. Summer camps, which are what bursting at the seams, as you heard Kevin talk about, the numbers going from 600 to over 1,100 participants. And then banquets, social events, and meetings. A lot of times during the off times, these facilities are great for birthday parties and receptions and fundraisers and things like that. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so, to sort of round out the executive summer, summary, the recommended rec facility will have a major impact on participation revenue. Um, right now, the FAF Center, is, as woeful as it is, is generating close to a half a million dollars in revenue. Um, and so we believe when you sort of move all that over to a new facility that will start out at about 1.3 and go up to about 1.8 million over a 10-year period, including that half a million uh, with new and expanded uh, abilities and offerings. And I think you heard um, from Mel and Kevin that they believe that those numbers are conservative and we like to think that they are too. Um, so these are, um, sort of just to let you all know what we were hired to do and what we weren't hired to do. The point of the study was proof of concept, feasibility, demand, all of those sorts of things, the financials. It was not to draw a facility, it was not to provide you detailed cost estimates and all of that. However, we believe that it's important to get a sense of this when you're walking into something like this. So we did retain, at our own cost, um, a firm that we've used before who's very well versed in sports design and did some order of magnitude cost estimates and so was able to put together, I think, a very efficient building. Now, this building that you see here is just um, most of the parts of it, you'll see the full, the full uh, enchilada here in a minute. Uh, what this includes uh, are two full-size gymnasiums that could go, that could go from four, two basketball to four volleyball courts, that's how that would work. Um, multiple multi-purpose rooms, those could be value engineered down if you had to. Uh, we, we're, we're recommending 2,000 square feet a piece and three of those. I think those could go down if you needed to, to about 1,600 square feet. Um, activity rooms, a couple more of those at 1,500 square feet um, that break into two halves. And so those are those green boxes down at the bottom. Those are perfect for birthday parties and those sorts of things um, during um, any time of uh, uh, day or night or weekend. Very popular in, in all of the uh, facilities that we've worked on and studied. Uh, and then support spaces. Uh, we don't have formal locker rooms here. We do have bathrooms, of course, we have offices uh, for staff, we have a kitchen, we have concessions, and we have a play area and a, and a game room. So you have all the support amenities, but this is um, very focused on the programmatic needs of the community, and not a lot of bells and whistles, this is not the Taj Mahal at all. What we're trying to do is be as efficient as possible with what you need, because, of course, uh, money is always needs to be used efficiently and good governance and government and all of that. So those are the main components. Now let's go to the next slide because there's one more component that is absolutely uh, demanded in the community 
as you can see, wow, that's a big green rectangle there. That is the indoor turf. And so that is a regulation size uh, indoor turf for soccer and of course can be used for, for multiple other um, indoor sports. And you have some pretty robust programs locally that we'll talk about um, that would use those. And you have a couple of groups locally that were considering building their own facilities if nothing gets built, but obviously, um, you know, money is always an, uh, an obstacle. And so what you have set up for you is a potential situation where you may be able to negotiate some anchor tenants and some long-term uh, contractually obligated income or nice partnerships with these groups uh, to utilize the facility so that you have more confidence going forward that your, you know, revenues are going to be there. Um, so that's a pretty big um, component of the facility. So the current situation, right now I've got the FAF Center. Um, we are at 90 years old, uh, 8,000 square foot, gross square foot facility, but really only, we say 4,700 square feet is usable, but to be honest, if you've been there recently, um, it's a pretty hodgepodge set of rooms. Um, there are columns in the way, so even the biggest space of 1,700 square feet has those columns in there, luckily with the, uh, the padding on them, but they're doing you know, high intensity stuff in there, and it can be dangerous. And you also have like heat registers and all kinds of other things. And the ceiling, while it's decently high, certainly isn't, the size isn't good enough for say basketball or golf or anything. It's quite small. The conditions of the facility are pretty um, poor. Uh, that's, a, that's a nice diplomatic way of saying it's, it's pretty pathetic to, to be honest. Um, so the pictures there, if you haven't seen it, there's a lot of do not use, do not touch. This is a dangerous place to be. You know, it's just not something that a community of your, you know, you have such nice everything else and it's, it's uh, there's this incongruity uh, between the rest of your community and this facility, it just doesn't sort of match up. So, um, you know, that just has to be pointed out, I think. In ter so this is sort of a graph showing what Kevin was talking about before in terms of your performance. Even in the last few years, you see that that line of participation and performance has gone up in terms of registrations, um, camps, programs, and all those things. And I think, I know I was talking to some folks before about this, Everything that they take on from a programmatic perspective, they do a lot of contracted um, programs, and they make sure that each of those generates at least a 20% internal profit so that they're not taking on anything that is um, that's going to be a net drain on the community's resources. So, um, And with that, you can see those numbers keep going up. So that's the historical revenue going up from 400000 to seven fifteen. Um, and so uh, they offer all kinds of programs and you've got this latest trend where the kids music classes are a huge hit. Um, but there's really um, more demand for all kinds of programs in space than can be accommodated by the FAF Center. Um, there's really minimal programming on the weekends because the type of need that exists, the FAF can't accommodate. But, um, doesn't have the types of facilities that you need, and the recommended facility would accommodate those, both local usage as well as tournament usage. Um, as Kevin was talking about also, um, and Mel as well, that really once you sort of hit that middle school age, they're, they don't really, they can't accommodate the older kids and what their needs are. And that is a, obviously a really critical time for kids' growth and development, as well as what they do in their free time activity. So for community purposes, they would like to be able to offer things, but they just don't have the, the space and the quality. Okay, local and regional supply and demand analysis. So what's, what's uh, available locally? Um, and Michael, jump in. I'm probably going to move fast through some of this, but I think this gets back to what I was talking about before. In terms of indoor facilities, if you see here, and we have that survey column on the left, so you've got... Um, the, the, the column on the left says survey, and it's hard to read. Just had my eyes checked, and I can read that. But uh, what it shows is the number of participants in the survey that have used these facilities. So 55.7% use the Kingsbury Club, uh, about 20% use Sluggers Academy, uh, and then it drops way off. Uh, Medfield Yoga Studio and Reebok CrossFit are in the 12 and 15% respectively. Everything else is in the single digits. 
But there's really not anything with, uh, besides the indoor tennis at the Kingsbury Club and, well, and, a, and a multi-purpose space at Sluggers, you just don't have basketball and volleyball in town. So let's go to the next slide. So that shows where things are within the city limits. Now let's look at the competitive regional supply. This is sort of your local region, right? This isn't like super regional. Um, and I know that's probably hard to read as well, but basically this shows you how far you have to go um, to get these different types of facilities, basketball and volleyball, are not here. Let's advance the slide. Um, this first of all shows you your drive times, but this is not what, this is without traffic. So it's not really a realistic um, map. It's, it's lovely if, if you're trying to promote something like, oh, we're just this far away. But the honest answer is if you go to the next slide, this is where you have to go for most of your indoor um, sports and recreation facilities. And what we have on the next slide is the drive time during rush hour. So that 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. time frame, you're looking at typically 20 to 30 plus minutes each way from Medfield to, to just go a few miles. And so imagine if you have more than one child. So if you have one, it's bad enough, right? So you're going 30 minutes one way, 30 you're hanging out, 30 minutes back. You're actually not in Medfield in the, the cooler months of the year, fall, winter, and spring, because you're somewhere else. And if you have two kids, then you're running all over. So that's that leakage I was talking about and that frustration of really just running around everywhere and the fact and, and uh, where it's located now is so convenient, a new facility wouldn't necessarily be there. Obviously the site question is a different question, but it would be in Medfield, right? And so that would save a lot of time and money and gas for a lot of folks. So let's go to the individual programs. I'm going to have Michael talk about that, um, the different programs and their needs. Thanks, Rob. Yes, we wanted to make sure we understood each individual sport within Medfield, what their current situation was, and what the demand would be for a new recreation facility. Uh, Medfield basketball, 650 total participants. Uh, they've got the travel program as well, which has more than 200 kids. And they it's a program that would like to practice twice per week but can't due to lack of gym space. Uh, they're renting four kicks for practices and uh, middle school gymnasiums as well but they have to play in surrounding towns. They can't host home games in Medfield due to the lack of gym space in the local community, which is definitely frustrating. Um, they're also hindered in growth. They can't even grow their, they can't grow the travel league due to the lack of gym space locally. Uh, they're paying market rates 75 to about $95 in surrounding towns, total of $74,000 in surrounding towns for gym space currently. That's some of that leakage that Rob talked about. And uh, definitely very interested in the opportunity for, for, new, for new gym space. It would probably be busy every single night from about 5 to 9 p.m. at least one gymnasium uh, according to Medfield basketball. Uh, Medfield soccer, six, 650 to 800 participants. Um, until, until the winter of 2016, they had been entirely outdoors, but they recently began hosting eight-week eight -week clinics at four kicks, paying up to $250 an hour. It's more of that leakage. And uh, regional clubs, we're going to get to this in a little bit, but regional soccer clubs would definitely be interested in uh, some indoor, indoor multi-purpose space to hold training, hold clinic, hold practices, and uh, potentially deal with inclement weather, which was another key discussion point. Uh, Medfield lacrosse, um, similar to soccer, they utilize four kicks. Everybody is le leaving town to go to four kicks, and uh, they're doing half fields at about $125 an hour. With those competitive prices, they would absolutely bring their practices, trainings, and clinics to Medfield if the facility existed. Uh, so some, some pent up demand for those two sports. Uh, Medfield baseball, um, very happy with the quality of the outdoor facilities. That was pretty consistent. Um, everybody's happy with, with, the, with the outdoor complexes, but uh, there's been increased competition with private clubs over the last few years, and that's limited their amount of field time. Um, travel clubs, elite players, training, practices, and clinics. They're forced to go to gymnasiums. There's no indoor flexible, calm-free indoor space. And, uh, they're utilize, and there's opportunity for those outdoor clubs as well within, within the sport of baseball. Uh, the after-school program uh, has been a tenant for about uh, 12 years now, hosting 4th, 5th, and 6th graders. And their primary limitation is the lack of a gymnasium. They can't really host middle, middle school students because they don't have the space and amenities for those students. Um, they, they are outgrowing the FAFS Center and they're about to reach a point where they can't grow the after-school program anymore. So, so they're extremely limited by space. 
Uh, Medfield schools, um, there's a strong need for Medfield schools for turf space. Uh, there's a, they have to balance between parks and recreation and school and the school programs uh, consistently in their own gymnasiums and the priority is with the schools so that limits some of these other programs. Uh, there's a constant need for gym space from baseball and softball clubs um, and they can't accommodate all of those requests. Teams are going to four kicks until midnight to find that indoor space for their training and practices. Um, so, so the synthetic indoor turf space is the, is the primary need. Um, we talked about some of those clubs. We wanted to make sure we spoke with uh, soccer and lacrosse specifically to understand the opportunity for this type of facility. So we spoke with uh, Global Premier Soccer and uh, one of the largest programs in the, in the country. And they talked about how uh, it's a 12-month commitment now. A lot of these families and youth, youth players are playing throughout <laughs> the winter months and need that indoor space. Right now, they're utilizing all three four kicks facilities, but they really like the location of Medfield and the opportunity for a facility here. It's central location. Um, and how they, it's comparison, to, comparison to Norfolk and its location, it would benefit their program significantly. Uh, the full size regulation indoor field at, at uh, peak season can do $200 an hour in each of the four quadrants. So that's a pretty significant revenue opportunity. And they mentioned potentially being interested in uh, some sort of partnership moving forward because they're interested in development. Uh, we, also, uh, we also want to understand Mass Elite Lacrosse's perspective. Um, about 550 girls as well as 600 to 1,000 girls in the uh, program. They have 550 in their travel, in their travel program. Uh, they're doing 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on the weekends in the offseason at Four Kicks and some of these other uh, complexes. And they kind of reiterated the same full size with drop-down netting would be able to host uh, significant training in the winter months as well as uh, accommodate inclement weather situations and weekends during the fall and spring months. Um, they haven't built anything yet, but they also express potential interest in partnering with this type of facility to, to accommodate their needs moving forward. Okay, so we also uh, distributed a community <coughs> survey. Thanks to Kevin for uh, providing some, some local contacts. We had about, we had 510 responses throughout the Medfield community, and 86% indicated that they have used the FAF Center. So definitely they, they understand the limitations of the FAF Center and the current situation within Medfield. Uh, this question asks, uh, what do they currently utilize within the FAF Center? What kind of programs? What are they using it for? Primarily sports leagues, programs, and camps um, are the, where the primary uses. Weekend programming, as you can tell, is extremely minimal. As Rob touched on, some of those birthday parties, some of those other social events can't be accommodated due to the quality of the FAF Center. The physical condition of the FAF Center, as you may have guessed, more than 75% indicated that it was low or extremely low quality. So everybody's using it, but nobody's happy with the quality. Um, only 2.1% believe that there are no challenges with the FAF Center. So very, very overwhelming. Um, current challenges with the recreation facilities in Medfield. What's missing? What are the challenges? Uh, lack of facility options, lack of indoor field space, and lack of gym space consistently came up as the three primary reasons, and that's kind of what uh, drove some of these demand and recommendations for, uh, for this project was, were those indoor, flexible sports, uh, multi-purpose spaces. Uh, what components would your household likely utilize? Uh, with the gymnasium, as we discussed, is the primary, uh, was the primary component. Running walking track, we had a lot of discussions about, and uh, based on some feedback, due to the cost, was not seriously considered for this, but uh, those fitness options, the indoor turf field, and the fitness, uh, the fitness center were uh, those primary components as well from the community survey. And uh, which recreational programs? So sports leagues and programming, the soccer that's currently limited by, by size, basketball, volleyball, those indoor sports that need high ceilings and flexible space were uh, consistently brought up throughout the survey. Into the recommendations. All right. Education. So in terms of the recommendations, it gets really back to what I was talking about at the beginning. You've got the, the gymnasium is absolutely number one. Um, the indoor turf is number two. And then the activity rooms, um, uh, in my opinion, sort of tie for second. Um, with, with the indoor turf. Um, those activity rooms are so multi-purpose. They can do so many things between um, Zuma classes and any sort of class that you're going to have, music classes, um, all sorts of events. So they're going to be very heavily utilized, just like you're utilizing them 
now um, in, in not so great spaces. So, uh, but I talked about some of the other amenities, which were brought up as a number four, top four thing is having the right amenities. So all of those things uh, were mentioned and we can certainly get into that during any Q&A. So again, this is just is the same um, drawing that we showed before, nice entry area by the little kitchen. And, uh, and then you get into the, all the different multi-purpose spaces, but very efficient. And then that's the whole thing with the indoor turf. Demand and financial projections. Um, I know for a fact you can't read this and it's not on purpose. Um, but uh, it, let's, I think, Michael, I don't know if you wanna talk about this or if we just should go to the summary. Um, because I think it's, what's important to show is that we feel like this is going to take what you're already doing well and just increase the sort of the volume on that, right? And so your, your revenues will be higher, your expenses will be a little bit higher, but we don't expect that they're gonna be so much higher in terms of full-time equivalent uh, personnel. Um, so we can certainly get into some of those numbers and, and I think you, some of you have the much more detailed report in front of you so we can talk about that. Um, but essentially we're showing a net operating um, positive for this facility. Um, so as Mel was saying, um, there aren't too many um, community departments that sort of contribute to their own funding. Um, this one is expected to, and so I think that's pretty critical. Um, let's go to the next slide. Oh, well, I thank you very much. Um, so yeah, we wanted to move through this fairly quickly. We appreciate that um, you have some additional detail in front of you and, and happy to to talk about that and answer questions. And of course, the folks from the internal uh, parks and recreation team are here as well to answer questions as well. Questions, Mike, yes? I have a starting question. What is it you're asking from the Board of Selectmen tonight? Well, we have no agenda. <laughs> well, that's our, good our, then, all right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for no, coming. No, let, let, me, let, let me tell you, so we're here to tell you the truth as far as we can tell, right? And what would be my recommendation? My recommendation would be that the next phase of this is, I, is acknowledging, I think, the truth of the situation, which is this is definitely a viable, feasible, needed thing in the community, right? But I think the next real question is, and as we've heard has come up, well, how much is this gonna cost? How much you know, uh, stuff can we put in a five pound bag, so to speak? Um, so that would be the next question that I think should be you know, investigated. And so I think that's been some of the conversation. That's beyond our scope. But again, we've, and, and by the way, I did not tell you what our sort of order of magnitude swag sort of costs were for the whole thing. But um, it was six to eight ish uh, million on the the main components, and then we, you add the pre-engineered out um, turf field, which is that huge green block. Um, that is quite a range. That could go from six to six to ten million. But again, um, we don't. That's not our business. It's not our job. But we do want you to know that this is a big investment. Uh, hopefully it'll be efficiently designed. Uh, I know there are a lot of things that are required here in terms of public buildings and costs and things that the private sector wouldn't always have to um, accommodate. So whatever you would build probably will be more expensive than what you know some independent private person could build. But, um, but that would be my recommendation is to sort of take this and move down the road to the, the costing side of it. Feel free, go ahead. So let me re reflect back what I think you just told me. So the, the cost is clearly an issue that's going to be important. You have made the case that the FAF Center is a pretty crappy facility. That was that's what we argument. call low-hanging fruit, guys. That was low-hanging <laughs> fruit, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what I'd like to do, though, is understand how you looked at how you defined this facility you're recommending. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure which of you to throw this at, but and the first place I want to come from is how when you make a recommendation like this for a town, mm -hmm. you draw the line between what, you, what is most properly a commercial facility and what is most properly a government or a, a town funded public facility. Yeah, so this is, this is always sort of an issue, right, of, um, of getting into a business, if you will, that the, the private sector is also in, in different ways, shapes, and forms. And um, 
And so, again, I think our charge is not to tell you whether or not, um, you know, how you fund it and, and all that, but whether or not a need exists and an opportunity exists. This is, a, this is a philosophical question. It's not how we fund it, it's how we go about meeting the need. Correct. And right. where, you, where you draw the line between the right. things that are most appropriately funded through, or even partially funded through town funds, if that's where they come from, and what should be left to the private sector to provide. Correct, and, and certainly those are political priorities and leadership priorities of the local elected officials to, to determine. So we would okay. suppose to lay that on you, so I'm gonna avoid that answer, right? Okay. I will say that, and we were just in a kickoff meeting with the Chicago Park District this morning on, on, a, on a project that, that they're doing, and um, I would say that the, the difference between a private operation that is solely focused on profit and only meeting the needs of the most profitable things and a public um, development is that the public development is for the needs of the broader community, usually and oftentimes at slightly lower price points, especially for certain types of things, um, or just offering things that the private sector won't offer because there's no profitable way to do it or there, it's not done in a quality way. And so it's sort of, it's a public service, but they're still generating revenue from it to cover most or all their costs in, in, in many of these cases, but it's not so much profit that it's gouging anybody and, and it's not so much that they can afford to necessarily take on debt themselves to do it. So there's that sort of middle ground and I think that's where they are. There are a lot of places that we work where it's, they're gonna lose money on the operations, no question about it, and the community says this is important to us because this, nothing exists. So, so let me take one more run at that question. All right. Uh, when you did your analysis, yep. there's clearly a lot of, there are a lot of facilities, some of which are broad facilities, some of which are niche facilities. Did you assess the impact that this facility would have and I'm particularly caring about Medfield businesses, mm -hmm. but did you assess the impact it would be likely that that would have on the businesses and what, what impact that could lead to in terms of taxes? We're happy to do that for you. Uh, however, that, that was, uh, that was um, not in this scope. It was typically something that we can uh, do. Um, and, and yeah, that, that, re that leakage that we talked about and retaining those things, that's absolutely something that um, we can do if, that, if you want to assess that one of the questions I had in looking at the survey results I mean you, you highlighted the absence of, of programming for sort of middle schoolers and high schoolers um, but I what I didn't see in here and maybe I missed it but was any sort of assessment of the actual demand for those kinds of programs I mean what the reality is I think you would always expect to see much higher utilization of a parks and rec program at younger ages mm -hmm. um, and full disclosure my family are heavy utilizers of the Parks and Rec programs, right? right. Um, but you'd expect it to be higher at younger ages. Right. And then right. as kids get older, they drop out of certain things. They start to focus on, on a couple of things they're going to do in different places. And so I, I didn't see that, that there's a, a crying need necessarily, at least one, not one that's analyzed in here for that age group, right? Because obviously those kids are in school. They're on school teams. I mean, and what's missing as well from your analysis is sort of any assessment of the school facilities, right? Because obviously when the kids go to middle school and high school, I mean, there are gyms in those buildings. And I agree that we need more, more gym space one way or the other, right? There's right. A, a shortage of gym space in Medfield, but I mean, there aren't no gyms in Medfield, right? And so what do you have in terms of evidence on the, for an actual demand from middle schoolers and high schoolers for additional programming, apart from right. the kids in sort of the elite specialized 12-month sure. sport programs? So first, I would agree with you. I think that that's, that's something that is a, a little bit missing. And it's anytime you're, and I, I'll probably ask Kevin to, to chime in as well, anytime you you know you can't accommodate something, you don't go and measure what you can't accommodate. So it's a little bit harder. Um, and I would agree that that participation level tends to go down pretty dramatically once you hit that uh, middle school and uh, ninth grade level. Um, so I, I, would, I would agree with you that, um, you know, there's not as much information on that. Kevin, do you want to? Uh, I think going to your point too, Michael, that um, 
Kevin, have Kevin do you, can you just use a microphone because otherwise people at home can't hear you. Thank you. Well, actually, no one at home can hear us now because we're still not broadcast live, but the people on YouTube watching this next week won't be able to hear us. Um, going to your point, Michael, um, we haven't served middle school and high school students. So I think the perception, kind of what you mentioned of at a certain point, um, we, they don't utilize Park and Rec programs. It's because there hasn't been the ability for Park and Rec to offer programs to, to that age group. So I think for, for the longest time, you know, I've been here about eight years, we haven't been, anytime we do offer something, for instance, we're now offering uh, the middle school ski club. We opened up registration this morning. We've taken 32 registrations in four hours before I left the office. I, that could have gone up since I left. We sell out that program every single year. Um, so I think if we had the ability to offer programs to middle school and high school students, um, and I'm not saying to the elite, to the, to the best of the best, to the sports kids, I'm talking just, just kids that are looking to do something that, that you know, something fun, um, something that's not offered at school, um, you know, when we are able to hit that target audience, you know, we usually hit a home run. Fair enough, but I mean, you know, you have these, and I don't think you didn't, you only have 27 slides or whatever it is, but in, in the, the larger presentation, you've got case studies from other example, other facilities that you're, I guess, suggesting are analogous to what you're proposing, and, and I didn't see that in there either. There's, I mean, it would seem like this is sort of a, a demographic kind of question, that you, there are towns that have these kinds of facilities, and you could point to the relative participation rates of kids in middle school and high school, because... I do see a little bit of a disconnect between um, sort of your outline of the facility and looking for additional programs for middle school and high school kids. You know, not every middle school and high school kid who's looking for something is necessarily looking for sports, right? And so, I mean, obviously, for the ones who, you know, putting the gym aside, for the ones who are interested in sports, this would, would help them. And even for the ones who just want to do it recreationally, it would help them. Um, and then, then it becomes more of a question for the town as to where it goes, right, if that's sort of the target population. But I think I would like to understand really what the demand is going to be for not just kind of a, a, kind of a niche program like a steam program, but what's the demand for, because I think the sort of like a boys and girls club type operation, right, where the idea if the kids are going to come after school and have, you know, pick up basketball after school or have some kind of an analogy to what the park and rec youth programs are, right, sort of filling the gap for, you know, for the kids in high school who want to play basketball, but, you know, they're not varsity basketball players and they might have played through midfield basketball through eighth grade, agree with you, there's nothing really for them in town, right, there's nothing, but, but the question I have is how many kids are in that category? Right, just to look at this from a financial standpoint, because I think I think we'd all agree the FAF Center is not adequate. And I think the, the question we're trying to answer and trying to work through is, you know, what does this new building look like? Right? What's the best version of it for to help the kids in Medfield ultimately? Right. And so um, those are two kind of data points that I thought were missing from from the analysis. Westwood uh, created a teen center for the high school kids. And apparently the uh, finding after they created it was that the high school kids never showed up. And so they, they morphed it into a teen center for the middle school kids. Uh, and I guess that's how it's operating now is my understanding. So yeah, you need to. I mean, it, it, it's, it's hard to measure something that's currently not there and you don't have a big baseline uh, to utilize. So I, I would acknowledge that. What we typically find uh, is that anytime we're sort of trying to go from nothing to something and you offer, you start to offer spaces that haven't existed and quality space and amenitized space that hasn't existed and those programs start to be offered, um, that, the, the, that there's almost always more participation than you would have projected based on the infinitesimal data points that you had to begin with. So I know that probably sounds a little bit um, out there, but that's our experience and so we didn't really take big leaps um, I think statistically with those older groups and programs we really stuck to the knitting with what we heard was out there but I, I think we could we could take a look at some of those demographics and, and well it would be helpful to see that for example if you're sure. talking about in your experience if you had okay here's what we were projecting when we did this facility based on this information here's mm -hmm. 10 facilities that we've done we projected X and then here's what actually happened in these 10 facilities you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's X times 
two or whatever it is. I mean, it's that sort of data that I think would be helpful to understand, at least demographically, to, to think about what the demand might be, mm -hmm. right? Because it's asking a lot of Parks and Rec to say, you're going to get, you're going to build this building, and you got to generate X amount of dollars to cover, right? I mean, if we, if we, if wherever this comes out, if you go to the town and we say, okay, we're going to, this is what it's going to cost. And these programs are going to generate X amount of dollars to, mm -hmm. to help fund the debt costs. Well, that really doesn't become, in anyone's mind, kind of a, a nice to have. It becomes a this is the number you have to hit, right? right. And then you really are running kind of a for-profit facility, which, which we're not in the business of doing, right? We're in the business of running, in the Parks and Rec Department, running programs for the children and adults of Medfield. And that's sort of the, and I think then maybe we're moving to the phase of more detail on exactly what the proposal is going to look like, how it's going to be paid for, what kind of partnerships would be involved. I mean, it may just be that we need some more data from you, but then we have to get down to actually putting some meat on this. Yeah, and I would say that typically in, in that next phase, I mean, you talked about impact, uh, you talk about the sort of the, the calendar planning and the programmatic planning of it. All that stuff typically is that next phase where you say, okay, if we're going to get serious about this, let's start running the traps on the design and the budgeting, but let's also get with staff and everybody and figure out, okay, what's the calendar going to look like? And, and, you know, we sort of did that already with our models, but this gets, you know, gets a lot more detailed in terms of that. So um, when we did uh, Great Park in Orange County, California, that there have been many where you do this sort of follow-on phase and you get into the nitty-gritty and you sort of discern each of those programs a lot more intensely. So, mm -hmm. um, What about in terms of the, I mean, you reference an, a, a number of private clubs that might be interested in mm -hmm. renting some of the space. In your experience in doing these programs, I mean, can those things be agreed in advance? I mean, do you ever get a private club that would agree, okay, oh, we're sure. committing to this amount, this amount of rental, this amount of money as part of the, the overall cost. So you know going into it, all right, you have, you know, just again, because there's a, a commercial element to this, at least the way this is presented, you know, your building is 60% leased already before you even you know, put your shovel in the ground kind of deal. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen the full, sorry, full spectrum of, of that from, you know, 100% government run where there's, there's you know, no intention of profit or anything like that all the way to a full turning it over to say such and such a soccer club or whatever that takes all responsibility for <coughs> revenues, expenses, and um, calendar, programming, tournaments, everything for a portion of the facility, whether it's indoor or outdoor, we've seen that where they just totally turn it over to them and say, we'll build it, we'll pay the debt service on it, but you take care of all the operating expenses, the CapEx, all that sort of thing. So we have seen those things. I guess I would just, um, that, that would be sort of those, dis those, those discussions would happen in the next phase, and I would just make sure you're, you know, cautious about moving into those conversations so that um, you're not necessarily giving away total control of the facility to, to a, one group or another, or that if you are going to allow them to help you run it, that you are very specific in the parameters so that you know that it's, you have your time for community use and it's not just gonna be used for them or their tournaments or, or whatever. So it's, it's, I think you have to thread the needle, but absolutely we've seen those things sort of take a bit of the yoke off the public sector. Could I ask you, this is a more general question, and Kevin, I'm gonna come around to you after he answers my question, so get ready. Um, and the w one reaction I had to the report you wrote as I was going through it is even in the executive summary, there's a, there's a litany of possible or projected things that will be, this facility will be used for. Um, Zumba, spin, basketball, lacrosse, uh, cooking, robotics, uh, safety training, technical training, and where you lost me was, I, I probably just didn't read it close enough, but when one of the, I think it was the multifunction rooms, but maybe it was the activity rooms that had the glass walls, which I understand would be really good for an exercise class, but a, but a spin class, I was trying to picture two things. One, there was a spot there where it said, well, we also can use this for indoor basketball and soccer. So I was trying to picture, 
kids playing soccer in a mirror-lined room, and I, I kind of lost it there. I, but I was also trying to picture, even if there were dedicated exercise rooms, mm -hmm. the people who would be hauling spin bikes in and out of that room between the aerobics class at 9 o'clock and the spin class at 11 o'clock and the 1 o'clock aerobics class. And it wasn't, it wasn't tracking for me. So my general question for you, there were a lot of things called out as possibilities or, or what I thought was vision for this thing so broad that it rang a lot of alarm bells for me and that there's no focus. Was the intent just to say, hey, you can do lots of things with this, or was it really the concept that I was reading about? Well, I think you make a good point. You have to be careful that something isn't so <coughs> multi-purpose that it's multi-useless, right? It, it's, and, and you also, though, don't want to get into a, a situation where you're making something super specific, like, it, and again, with a weight room or, or spin class, you know, that is harder to flip for another use. Right, I mean, right. that's a pretty much a permanent thing or, or difficult to, to maneuver. So, yeah, I think most of those things, I will say, in the, in the litany mm -hmm. uh, were things that they're either, they either have measured demand for or have attempted or done in the past. Um, but some, I don't think you could do all of them. And I will say in our pro forma and our projections, we did not necessarily assume that you were going to do all of those things in the same room, you know, back to back. and. Okay. You know what I mean. Okay. So now, now my question for you, and, and this actually ties even a little bit into what Park and Rec is doing right now. You mentioned the, that the music program is really uh, exciting. I think in the report there were things about drama. Um, you were talking about the robotics and the technical training, and, and where it led me was I was thinking about the makerspace in the library. I was thinking about the discussions we've been having around establishing a cultural center at the Lee Chapel. Uh, in the discussions around demand for gyms, one of, the, one of the quick reactions I had early in the executive summary when they said you can have a gym is I was immediately thinking of the gym right next door to the PATH Center in, the, in Dale, which maybe isn't available, but it was like, it's not exactly like there's no basketball courts, you know, accessible at least if they're available. Do you, what's the, what, maybe you haven't even checked yet, but do you have the endorsement of the Cultural Council, the library, the schools for what you're trying to do here? I don't think we went that far. We've talked to the schools, and the schools agreed that they would they would have usage of facility space. You know that there is, you know, you talk about the Dale Street School. They use that after school, so we don't. <laughs> yeah. So we can't you you know we do have one program there a week on Wednesday nights, um, but that's one program. We use the Memorial School gym one morning on Saturday mornings for a kindergarten basketball league. So that's the space that we've been. Um, granted for usage by, by the schools in the, in the gyms, because they do have uh, a, a lot of stuff going on. Um, as far as endorsements, no, we haven't talked to them. I mean, we do a lot of those things. Um, you mentioned, you know, we do a lot of those drama and music and, and, and enrichment programs already. Mm -hmm. You know, we offer those um, uh, very popular with, with us. So um, it's stuff that we've, we've been doing for years. Yeah, and I'm not... I'm not challenging that piece, but what I'm getting at is that there's a number of initiatives that are going on here in town that will have implications for some of this stuff. I know I would, I would feel a lot better as we move ahead knowing and hearing enthusiastic support for whatever we're doing to address all those needs. Uh, where that leads me, and this is strictly preliminary because I understand I just read this like this week, so it's not... It's not a position, it's a reaction. Mm -hmm. But the word that kept bumping up for me was, I don't see focus here. I see, and, and that's got to do with why I asked you the question I did. I don't see focus in terms of target population. Uh, in the executive summary in the very beginning, it talked about this was a plan to meet the towns and regional needs, which again, for purposes of the town looking at a facility that meets a town recreation requirement, if we were doing a marketing plan for a new commercial facility, you're darn right I'd want to see regional needs in there, but it led me to say, what's driving this train? There's a lot of things here, there's a lot of different people. I'm not asking for a response, I'm just giving you that reaction to what I've seen so far. We would be 100% Medfield resident based. You know, it, The regional aspect came about if we had open space available, eight o'clock at night on, on a Wednesday. Yeah, no, okay. I, um, I mean, I've had preliminary discussions with, with other town recreation departments when, when we talk about, when I enthusiastically talk about this type of facility, and they say the minute you put a shovel in the ground, you let us know, because we can provide 
rental income from groups that we know in town. Um, so that I think is where the regional aspect came. You know, we are not looking to uh, be 10% Medfield and 90% regional. This is 99% Medfield, and if if the if we have met all the needs of the Medfield community, anything left over beyond that, we we would look beyond. And, and my comments, although I know they probably sound critical, you should know that I have been very impressed with how you have managed and developed and grown the program. So this is not like I'm dismissing this all. It's just that that was my reaction. Thank you. And yeah, and I'll, uh, the if I can comment, the the focus of so many communities these days is to jump on this youth sports tournament bandwagon and ho fill hotel rooms and that sort of thing. That when we started this, the very first conversation we had about this last December, mm -hmm. we asked you, is this more about you or is this more about tourism, right? And, and, the, and the answer was, it's about us. However, if there's a way that we can capture some of that in addition to, um, you know, attending to the needs of the community, like you said, if there's extra space and time on the weekends, especially when the local usage tends to be less, um, then that's a great way to generate extra revenue to support the case, right? Yeah. So I think that was the, the idea. Right. Anything else, Kevin? Um, yeah, just a couple of statements I want to make. One, um, I'm not sure the town has given all the other burdens placed upon us has a responsibility to provide adult recreation i think that's probably something better left to the private sector i understand sound mind in a sound body i can understand the fat center is a horrible shape um, and we need to provide uh, recreational opportunities for our kids but i think once you become an adult you're sort of on your own, and if you want to join the Kingsbury Club or the, uh, you know, whatever the CrossFit training program or the yoga program, those opportunities are there, and you can choose to do it through the private sector rather than through the taxpayer, because most taxpayers, adults, will not utilize those service services and resent ha having to pay for it. I don't think they mind for kids, but I think when it comes to adults, they feel let the private sector do it. I just want the public to know, just a quick rundown uh, while they're making these decisions, and this isn't aimed at Park and Rec, it's just the, the whole spending tone in general. Currently, as of June 30th, the town owed $57 million in principal and interest on existing debt. In addition to that, we have $60 million in unfunded OPEB and pension liabilities. Uh, last year, we built a $1.7 million track and field, totally funded by the taxpayers. Uh, we're looking at your project, which is in the order of $20 million. Um, the school committee is looking at replacement of the Dale Street School and probably the low figure I've seen so far is $16.2 for that. Uh, the Senior Center, the Council on Aging, is looking for an addition to the Council on Aging building. Uh, later on tonight, we have another item on the agenda asking the selectmen to support a cultural center at the State Hospital, which will uh, certainly have a price tag for that. And we're 94% residential tax base. Our average tax bill is approaching $11,000. So I think the taxpayers of Medfield need to look at all those things in context and say, what is most important of that long list and other items that are on the table or will soon be on the table? And how much can we afford? $11,000, it's almost $1,000 a month when you think about it. And that's a pretty hefty tax bill by anyone's account. So um, I, I agree we need to provide rec rec recreation for youth. I question whether the public sector should be providing recreation for adults. Thank you. Any more comments on this? I have one. I'm going to yeah. push back on you, Mike, um, because I want to get another point out about this. I, uh, everything you said is valid. Um, however, 
I would hope the taxpayer, we haven't gotten to the financing issue yet. In fact, we haven't even gotten to the cost issue yet. Uh, I wouldn't automatically assume that the answers to any one of these kind of discretionary but perhaps important things has to be the taxpayers pay for it on a tax levy. So at this stage of the game, I would like to know that we've done a good job of really understanding what the citizens, the residents of the town would like, and in, in, in if it's adults too, that's okay. With the demand and the need is there. When we get to the finance question, I'm gonna be right in Mike's corner about whether we can afford it on a tax levy. So there'll be another issue around how we could creatively find ways to fund this outside of the tax levy that would make something possible. That might tie your hands or it might stretch the time, uh, but there are models of that where a community has had a very nice recreation center uh, that they put up that met what the, what, people, what the people who wanted to use it wanted and it wasn't funded off taxes. So I agree with your point, but I wouldn't want people to automatically assume this has to be a tax, tax fund, taxpayer tax levy funded project or at least not in its entirety, however that works. Yeah, I mean, uh, Four Kicks obviously is a profit-making uh, uh, entity, and it basically is the same thing, and it's uh, it's making a goal of it its own. Yeah. It's paying its debt service, apparently, so it's... it's. I, I, the one I go it's to, working. and there was a big donor, I understand, at the start, but I go to the Hayden Complex in Lexington, which was 100% funded with private funds. Now, a big donor got it started, and that's a bigger complex than we want, but I'm saying that's a possible route to the people who care the most. Uh, and you've already heard from me. Part of the reason I say this is we took a run at this once 10 years ago, and the people that wanted it knew what they wanted, and it wasn't what the taxpayers were willing to pay for. So I guess we've got a concept plan, uh, and we know that uh, in, in the concept it seems to be in demand and seems to work. Uh, but we, didn't, we don't have anything on the, on the cost, really, other than the 12 to 18 million range, and. Uh, and, that, and then we just don't have any indication of the town's willingness to pay for it. So more work to do. So thank you, Park and Rec. Thank you guys for coming thank to you. Chicago. Thank you. Um, since you came from Chicago, we gave you three times the amount of time we'd allotted for you. <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> um, so our, our 720 appointment is uh, DPW Director um, Maurice Goulet discuss pavement management plan, road and sidewalk maintenance, tree planting, bridge repairs, North Street reconstruction. Thanks for coming, Bo. And how much money are you looking for? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like, what I'd like to do is try to give you guys a, uh, a brief update of different projects that we're kind of involved in right now. Thank you. And please stop me at any time and uh, ask any questions you'd like. Um, one of these items is the bridge projects. Uh, I'd like to start with the Phillips Street Bridge. Um, we have, right now, the 100% uh, submission has been submitted to MassD, uh, MassDOT, uh, plan specs, estimates. We're looking for the final review comments from them. So um, that's in the works. Um, we are developing an RFP for Fabricator for the, for the bridge deck to be, uh, to be made. We were hoping that everything was going to be happening before the end of the, this year so we can get the bridge open as soon as possible. Unfortunately, uh, right now, the fabricators are saying they're about 16 weeks out. Um, all of them that we've uh, contacted through our engineering consultant. So that puts us out to February. So, um, uh, you know, it could be earlier. I can't guarantee that. But, uh, you know, the, the outset is 16 weeks, which is a fair estimate, especially during the holiday season. Uh, things slow down. They are governed by the timber treatment industry that uh, kind of governs that. So we are hopeful to, to have everything completed uh, by springtime at this point. But, um, you know, it, uh, we did save $100,000 by going through the state process. Um, but um, you know, it is a process, and it has to go through channels before we can get it done. So we are trying to get that done as soon as possible. Um, Another uh, bridge kind of uh, issues that we have is the West Street Bridge on the Millis Line as well as the Main Street Bridge on the Millis Line. Both of these bridges I wanted to put on to the uh, Transportation Improvement Program to have the state and federal, I mean, that's, it really shouldn't be the burden on the town. 
to pay for these projects. Um, we are inundated by commuter traffic from all over the Commonwealth uh, through this area. And um, uh, we don't, we shouldn't have to bear the, the brunt of these pay, uh, payments, but um, the state did inspect the West Street Bridge recently and did find some deficiencies that uh, they would <coughs> like us to repair as soon as possible, us and the town of Millis. We are scheduled for a meeting at the end of this week um, to get together with the town of Millis to discuss things and try to develop a strategy with our town rep, uh, town re uh, state reps to see if we can't uh, push these bridges onto the bridge programs that the state offers as soon as possible. So uh, we are working on that. Ultimately, well, we, is, the, yep. is the bridge program that the state offers, is that different than the TIP? Is the TIP federal money? It, it's, the, it's the TIP, but it's a part of the TIP where it's, they deal with all the bridges. The, unfortunately, West Street and Main Street are town-owned and maintained bridges. Even though the state had built them in the past and turned it over to the jurisdiction of the towns. Um, but we really feel that it's not, the bridges are, are failing not because of what's happening in the town, it's, it's a lot of um, different cities and towns passing through both ways, both commutes. I mean, you see it on 109 and 27, we have a tremendous amount of traffic going through town. So um, ultimately, we may have to uh, pay some of this money to do temporary repairs if, this, if we can't get the uh, state reps to push these bridges fast enough for us, because we want to make it safe. We want to make sure that things are, are done correctly. But w what is the order of magnitude on that? Um, as far as which bridge? No, on, the co on what the cost would be if we have to front some of this from this latest I unfunded mandate. From I the don't government. have any cost at this time. I, it's probably in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. As opposed to the millions. So as it's a six-figure problem, not a seven-figure problem. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. So those are the bridges. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the 109 project that we just uh, encountered. I thought it was a very successful project. Uh, I want to... Uh, really give kudos to the uh, our Department of Public Works, especially the Highway Department, the Police Department, and the contractors that were involved in this project. Um, they worked very well together. Coordination was was fantastic. Our pre-construction meetings were very um, very productive. Um, I do want to thank the residents of the town that had to deal with uh, the overnight issues that we had and. Uh, we, did it, we did it overnight because if we did it during the day, uh, we'd probably still be doing it today. So, <laughs> so I do want to do. We do appreciate uh, the, you know, um, the cooperation from the from the town residents that had to put up with that for the f four nights that were we did that. Um, it was. It, I will say, from my perspective, it was exceptionally well done. I mean, it's my house is right there, and I mean, it was to do that in four nights. That was really well done. I mean, that was you picked the right time to do it. Looks like it was a good job overall, but in terms of efficiency and how it was managed, I thought it was an A plus. So great job. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the pavement management system. I know we've talked about this for a little while. Um, right now, we have an engineering contractor out there. Um, you might see uh, little um, little pickup trucks that say Beta Group on there. They are surveying the roads, finishing up surveying the roads, and what they're doing is looking at lengths, widths the stresses of the, um, of the roadway surface. Um, they collect, they're doing a conditions assessment and putting it all into a software program. <coughs> we are looking at uh, a formal presentation probably the first of the year. It could be sooner, but uh, I'd like to you know, say that probably the first of the year we'd be looking at. Uh, and this will give us uh, an idea of uh, the capabilities of this pavement management system. Um, I hate to just keep saying that you know, it's going to do this and that, but it will. Uh, that presentation will give us an idea of what our um, infrastructure improvement costs are. It could be, I, I've done, we've done this in the past in other cities and towns and um, you know, it could be 15, could be $20 million. That's if you wanted to fix every road in town and make it complete. Uh, I'm not saying that's gonna be that high for Medfield, but uh, you know, the idea of the pavement management system is to create a system where you're we're putting the money towards the best interest of the town, trying to fix the roads that matter the most, and try to get um, keep their good roads good as well. So and ultimately save money for the town by save the money in town. It's a, it's a long-term project. It's a long-term goals. It doesn't happen overnight. We can't uh, 
paint the town black, so to speak, but, uh, you know, love to do it. It's just, uh, it's gonna take a lot, but this is a, a great start and a good opportunity to, to make good management decisions. Um, North Street, just wanna talk a little bit about North Street reconstruction. Um, as we talked in the last, last meeting I had with, with you, um, there's kind of three alternatives. One is to continue what we're doing and try to convince the state that it's a worthwhile project to put us in the transportation improvement program, to give us state and federal funding. Um, but because of the nature of the, of the job and um, the criteria that they use to, to uh, rate these jobs, it's a, it's a long, long uphill battle to get, to get the money. And to do a state project like that, they would want a state layout, which is a lot wider than we have now. Uh, land takings, uh, permanent easements, uh, which drives the, the cost of the project up. Um, looking at anywhere between two and a half to three million dollars. That's one alternative. Another alternative is to, I think we talked about it, Mike, is to uh, bring it to the town and ask if they wanted to um, spend the money to, to get it all done in one shot. Again, um, the biggest part of that project is to replace the culvert. And again, with the, if we did the state layout, it would be a lot wider project. Another alternative that uh, Mike and I were talking about is uh, possibly do it in-house with our contractors, but it'd be phased over um, a few years. But the, the scope would have to be tuned down to a town layout rather than a state layout, which what is what we have out there right now and we could phase out and do sections of the sidewalk and eventually get the roadway done. The biggest cost of this project, again, is the, is the culvert. We would need to replace the culvert. We have inspectors looking at that now, trying to get a price uh, just for the culvert repair so we can separate that out. But in the meantime, we could phase this project out um, using Chapter 90 funds and not um, putting the burden on the taxpayers. Okay. So I think on that, I think, in I think we need to understand the differences between two and three. I, I think from my, my perspective, option one is not really an option. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. The state's not going to pay for it. Yep. Um, and so it's really between option two and option three. And I think we've got to understand, you know, what the differences are. Um, you know, it's a crucial enough road and it's a, I wouldn't say it's troubled, but I mean, it, it needs work, right? Yep. So, and it's important enough to the overall flow of the town that I think it's, it's most important that we do it right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and have it be a permanent solution rather than, than a 20-year solution, you know, as opposed yep. to... And so I think, well, we should try to save some money and understand what the plans would be off of the state layout. Um, I, think it, I think we should kind of explore both options two and three because the, the, the issue with the phase approach is that you're kind of under construction for years. Yes. You know, and and, and the, one of the challenges of using our in-house guys who are great is that there's obviously a lot of other demands that they have right and so if you look at the well, I mean in-house meaning uh, using the town's contractors not so okay. much the towns oh I, see. I mean do as much as we can with our town departments oh I see but also use utilizing our contacts okay. rather than having it under the state's right realm. but but also you you also be constrained under that approach to the availability of chapter 90 money right and, Correct. and chapter 90 money has got to be used for other stuff uh, as well, and so I think we'd like to understand two and three mm -hmm. because you know done well, it's a nice extension of the downtown. Um, and I think the other piece that we have to look at when we're doing it now, just to understand, is, is burying the power lines. I mean that's something that the downtown study committee came out with, however many years ago. And um, for me personally, that's you know I never really noticed that it's bad to have them, but I know for some people they like to have them buried. And I think that's another issue where it's just up for the taxpayers to decide if it's important to them or not. But we should at least do the prep work so that we can put it in front of them. And, and from a procedural standpoint, I think it would, it would be two Warren articles. Yep. It would be one for the reconstruction of North Street and would one for bearing the power lines. And people can decide if they want to lay out. I think it's probably a million bucks or so. Is that the basic There's a cost rough for, estimate of the cost Mike, of bearing the lines? You yeah. know, if people want to pay it, they can vote for it. If they don't think if, if, it, if it's not an eyesore, they can vote against it, right? I mean, I for me... They don't bother me, um, but to me, that's kind of an aesthetic judgment for people to make, and we should at least give people um, the opportunity to say whether they want to do that or not. I mean, that was the recommendation from the downtown study committee, what, 
12 years ago or 13 years ago that that should be done if possible. This would be the one time to do it. Yep. Um, and we should, I think we should at least have, we should, we should at least know what it's going to cost so that the people can make the decision about it. Um, and then maybe they'll just say no, and then that's done and we've done it and we don't need to talk about it anymore. Each of those projects go hand in hand. You can't do one before the other. Right. So, I mean, one has to be done, um, the putting in the, the underground utilities, unless you do underground conduits to, in the meantime, get the roadway done and then remove the poles afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very difficult to coordinate with an Eversource or a Verizon to, to, to move poles. It's, it's a year, year, it takes years, it's, uh, it's a process. Right. So it does, it does tie it up as well. But. Yeah, so I think we should scope both yep. of those things out and then people can decide and we can figure out, you know, between the incremental approach or the one-shot deal, wh whatever works best. But um, I, think, I think we should, from my perspective, I think option one is off the table, so it's between two and three. Okay. So. Yeah, I'm in the same place, and I think we just need more information about two and three. Absolutely. Well, what's the time frame that's in your head around when that project might take place? Well, which which option? North Street. Well, uh, both. If there's different time frames. So, if you did option two and did the state layout, uh, we still need to finish the design for the state, so we still have to go through the process like we're doing with uh, the Phillips Street Bridge, but at a higher scale. Um, that would be the first step. The second step would be to um, get it all bid out. The state would take over the job. They would run it. It would be um, a state project where it would be under construction for as long as it would take. The cover would be the first thing. So I would say that if you decided to do next year, you decided to do option two, uh, continuing the state layout would probably be about three years out to start. But if we were paying for it, why would the state take it over? Well. If you didn't do a state layout, I would suggest you go with the state. You still need to have the design done to the state standards if that's what you wanted to do. That's why I'm saying that there's a state layout and there's a town layout. <coughs> if you did the state layout, I would suggest that the, the state it would be run by the state to uh, ensure that the job is done according to their standards. So then there are there really three options. In, <coughs> if you did the town layout, could you do the town layout all at once too? as opposed to incrementally? You could do the town layout all at once, okay. yes. So there's really three options. Yeah. I'm going to look at the town layout. It sounds like so it's F, it, the construction would occur F, FY21 at the earliest. I would, I would I, that's my best guess. Um, just going back to one on Route 109 again, um, I've been we put it on with the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, the MPO, with our uh, regional planning office um, trying to get 109, the full corridor from Millis all the way to, is it Dover on the other side? Starts at Dover, right? Change the wall pole. Yeah. Um, trying to get that whole corridor done with state and federal funding. The, what we did on 109 right now is a, a paving job, but it was uh, to get rid of a lot of uh, deficiencies on the roadway. It is a, if you want, if you will, it's a Band-Aid. Uh, hopefully it's a 10-year 10, 10 or more Band-Aid. Uh, we're looking to push 109 to get federally funded to do the whole project with sidewalks and everything else. Um, but that's a very hefty project. Um, have to do a lot of meetings with the MPO to try to, try to phase that out as well. Um, similar to Medway, but not a Medway project, hopefully. <laughs> 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 but, um, but anyways, um, it's... That was one of the ones that we would like to put onto the Transportation Improvement Program. Um, it's just uh, a lot of money that we should not be spending, that we should have, but it just takes time, and unfortunately, so it's either come up with the money ourselves and do it right away, or, or hopefully we uh, push them hard enough to, to get the funding. We bought ourselves some more time. Yes, we did. Um, on the list, I believe there's a tree planting just want to let you know that um, we are following the tree planting plan. I, I do have a tree planting plan that was developed, I believe, um, a few years back. It's in our office. We are trying to follow that plan. Right now, if you notice, there's uh, at Montrose School. We, we removed some of the, there was two trees that were really um, um, kind of breaking up the sidewalk. We took those out. We planted three new trees coordinated with Montrose School. Uh, we have three new trees on their property right now. The next uh, goal is to kind of uh, coordinate with the post office uh, according to the plan 
trying to put some trees uh, where the mailbox drop-off is, and then continue on to Main Street and eventually um, on Route 27, according, according to the plan. So that we are working towards that goal. Um, so, uh, we, are, we are moving in that direction anyway. Um, sidewalks. Sidewalk project on Metacomet. Uh, if you've been down Metacomet near the schools, um, our DPW Highway Division had built the uh, retaining wall, stone wall near South Street. Uh, we have some very talented people. Um, very proud to, to be part of that uh, DPW. They also did all the prep work for the sidewalk. We had a contractor come in, very reasonable, did the granite, uh, poured the sidewalk. Um, that is the project just about complete. Right now we're working on the other side of Pleasant Street, doing a, um, a ramp to accept a crosswalk from that sidewalk to go to the park. So that should be complete within the next week or two. Absolutely. <coughs> Could you just use the uh, microphone? So, I've been trying to get a sidewalk put in between uh, on Dale Street between Charlesdale and Grove, mm -hmm. and there's definitely a need for kids walking to school there. And it comes over a crest, and there's there's really no room for the kids to walk, and they're actually in the road. Uh, I've talked to various people, and there's definitely uh, they're all in agreement that there is a need there, but I can't seem to figure out how to how to push that forward. So we, we've discussed uh, that sidewalk at length, and um, there's, there's two things. One is that it's not just being able to throw a sidewalk down to connect it. Um, if you look at the, the area there, trees would have to be removed. Could be a re realignment of the roadway because it is such a, a tight area for a sidewalk to go there to be safe. Um, we are looking into that. Uh, we're also looking into I know that um, we also talked about when the, there was plans for the 40 Bs to be coming into that area, which I know is a sore subject, but it is uh, planned, was planned for the Dale Street corner and across the street, across from the cemetery. Um, I know there's probably a, another um, plan for a 40 B. We're looking for uh, a possibility of mitigation these are just ideas going through, but it is a lot of it is a big cost for that small sidewalk just to put that in. But we are looking at it, and it is on our radar. Well, the, the 40B doesn't affect that section. No, it doesn't. Uh, if it was on that side, it would be an easier mitigation. But if they did put a 40B on the other side, it could be uh, a way of mitigating that sidewalk there as well. Yeah. The other side is the cemetery. Right, uh, but I'm saying if. It, I'm talking about on across 27. Yeah. Well, I, I just hope the trees aren't cutting down trees is not the reason why we're not doing it. You know, it's well, it's not just the trees; it's the realignment of the roadway too. It's a it's a very big expense. It's not that it's not important. It's just this, there's a lot of pressures for everywhere, um, for sidewalks, for to, for people's roadways and everything else. It's just not a lot of money to to go around. So we're just trying to do the best we can. Once this pavement management system comes in, it will. It doesn't take into consideration about that particular sidewalk section, but again, it, it does show us where the, the best uh, way to spend the town's money, where it sh should be spent to make good decisions. Yes. So, sir, can you just use the microphones, please? Thank you. Uh, speaking of sidewalks, yes. the North Street plans, do they include sidewalks? They do. Okay, because right now it's kind of a painted line on the road in front of our house. And it There's would a be, lot of it would foot be grand traffic curbing, there. It would be sidewalks. It would be most likely concrete. Um, Great. Thank you. Yep. The second most expensive part of the project after the culvert. Correct. I Correct. Yep. Correct. So would that affect uh, things like fencing, or how does that affect easements? It would have to be looked at case by case. But if we did the, if we did the state layout, depending on which side of the street, it would more, more than likely would take into moving fences and having to rebuild things. Is that at our cost or the state's cost? It would be at the town's cost. Okay, and so if there's a fence there, do we, I mean, I don't know how that gets. Unless you get out. state federal funding, okay. then it would be their cost. I but uh, yeah. But it, it would be case by case. It depends on, on the plan. Um, if it's a state layout, they look for a, a larger, a wider right of way. And when that comes in, they, they try to do that corridor all the way through. So it could mean the town might have to take land by eminent domain and go right through and then move things accordingly depending on what's out there. 
So any fence or structure, that would be our cost to replace? It would be whatever the, not, not the homeowner, but the town's cost for the project. Oh, okay. Great, thank you. It would be encompassed in the town's project. Thanks, Mo. Yep. Anything more? Um, one more thing. Um, tonight we're going to ask for a, an award for the uh, salt bid, ro the rock salt bid. I just want to give you uh, just what has happened in the past with the prices. In 2014 to 15, the price per ton for, for roadway salt, rock salt, was $59.98. 2015 to 16 was $65.80 per ton. Last year, we paid <coughs> $53.50 per ton. They had a, uh, they had a, uh, a surplus of, of rock salt because it was a milder winter the year before. This year, we got it for $45.20 per ton, which is a, a great cost uh, savings for us. Um, I think one of the reasons why is uh, the winning contractor, the winning bidder, uh, did open up a new depot terminal in Quincy, which s will serve the surrounding area. So it's a little cheaper for them to, to deliver to us now instead of going from Chelsea. So. Good. Good. Right. Okay, this is, so I get the, the fun thing about being a slack is you get to learn all sorts of trivia things. So you have three kinds of salt, CC, solar, and treated. What's yep. the difference? Okay, uh, CC is regular rock salt. Is that calcium chloride or no? Nope. Just just a regular rock salt right from the mines. Okay. Uh, solar salt is a uh, salt that's is mined differently. Um, it ha doesn't have the same properties, but it has the same melting capacity as rock salt. And the, the treated salt is a chemical that's added to the salt to enhance the melting capacity. Okay. We do that right now at our facility. We treat our own salt. Okay. So. Thanks. Yes, sir. Can you use the uh, microphone? And while you're getting that, I'll just ask my question, which is I know that some people use things like beet juice to, yep. uh, is, is that something that? There's all different chemicals that you can use on the roadways. Um, we find that the magnesium chloride that we use uh, for the price that we pay and for the, uh, for the job that it does is our best option right now. Okay. We can, um, we can pay a lot more money for a product that may be a little better, but it's, it doesn't uh, doesn't serve. We don't feel it's it's worth the extra money okay. for what it does. Yep. So, all right. I, thanks for all the information, sure. Maurice. Um, is the state design for North Street is it variable the width by design, or can you tell us if it's going to be eight feet wider than the town design? What's what's the width difference between state and that. town? Um, I wasn't. I haven't seen the actual design myself. Um, I know it's been in the works since 2009, I believe. Okay. I wasn't part. I wasn't here yet for for that. But um, I will be speaking with our consultant, who's been on top of that. Right now, it's been in limbo. It's been uh, the state has come back with a bunch of comments that we have to address if we're going to go in that direction. Just hate to spend money going a certain direction and then having to come back and redo the design. Sure. So okay. that's that's where we're at. I don't. It's mostly a, a standard width. It could be a 56-foot layout, um, but that includes grass strips, that includes sidewalks, that includes uh, roadways and shoulders. And the current town width for North Street right now is um, what? The layout is probably around in the 40s. Okay. So it would have to be extended probably another. But 10 to 16 feet? I would think. Okay. So one of the, one the, of the big benefits of the town layout, if we do it in that way, is that we could impact the, the neighborhood less. Yeah. Um, so that that's probably a discussion once we get, we're going to get financial figures back from Mo, and then I would assume the town would come to the people that live along there and, and have a discussion about what they want as well. Yeah, I, I believe the current pavement width within that layout is somewhere between 18 and 22 feet yeah. from, the, from the past studies we've done. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it, then you have the sidewalks. Yeah. And the state is very big on bike paths these days. They want bike paths put everywhere, and that's they like eight feet. They will satisfy will f be satisfied with four, but they want them on both sides of the road. And then you have ADA to comply with, uh, so you need a certain sidewalk width, which can prevent planting trees for two reasons. One, they throw up the sidewalk and create ADA problems. Also, you don't have your minimal clearance. So. It's a lot of things you have to take into consideration. And we'd love to move that pole on the corner of Green Street. 
Anything else for our DPW director? Thank you very much, Mo. Thank you, Mo. Thanks for having Ms. me. Mr. Chairman, while you're here, I would like to thank the Public Works Department and the Police Department and Memo for the incredible cleanup job they did, setup job and cleanup job they did on Midfield Day. You know, if you went by North Street at 5 o'clock on Midfield Day, you wouldn't have known anything had gone on there. It's amazing how quickly that was taken down. Yeah. And what what a great yeah. cleanup Most job! Most of the cleanup was done by the DPW, so I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mo. Take care. Um, next, we've got uh, let's see uh, our 740 appointment. Uh, we're almost an hour behind. Uh, David and Robert McCready, developers, discuss proposed LIP project at 93 9395 North Street. Mr. Chairman and Selectman, my name is Russ Hallisey. I'm here representing Open Spaces Builders on a uh, proposed 40B project uh, under the uh, local initiative uh, program. Um, you have some uh, pictures of uh, the initial proposed uh, project. Um, it consists of uh, two buildings. Uh, the first building being uh, currently on North Street at the front of the property. Uh, it had been uh, redone uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it contains two units, rentals. The proposed uh, second building will be in the rear of the build in the property, uh, proposed to have 12 units, three floors, four units each. The first two floors being two bedrooms, apartments and the top floor being single bedroom apartments. The whole project uh, is intended to be rental. Uh, the 40B aspect uh, being that 25% uh, of the units would be affordable units, the rest of the project being market rate and under the 40B program uh, since it's rental units, the whole project would be considered uh, under, the afford, under the 40B uh, plan. The ultimate goal is to contribute to next year's needed inventory to keep Medfield within its safe harbor uh, program. A little side note, we're informed that uh, the rear of the front building, the existing front building, uh, Lowell Mason had lived in there during uh, his time in Medfield. So the idea is to, ma to name the place, the project uh, Mason Place at this point. We've made an initial presentation to the newly formed Affordable Housing Trust. We received positive feedback from them. We're continuing to work with them. And we're hoping to be finished uh, with them uh, at their November 7th uh, meeting, their next meeting. And tonight's uh, presentation is uh, really an initial present presentation before the selectmen uh, to introduce you to the, pr to the project um, as far as it's uh, been uh, developed to this point. And tonight we have uh, David Scharf with us tonight, who is the project architect. And we also have Dave and Rob McCready uh, for the developers. So at this point, I'll let uh, Dave tell you a little bit more in details of the plans and the site and et cetera, the buildings. Um, so you can see here the way the site is laid out. This is North Street um, on my right. Um, this is the existing two-unit um, house. Um, the front part is kind of Greek Revival in style. I think most of you are familiar with that. Right now, sort of as you come in the driveway, there's an old garage barn structure. And uh, we're still trying to think through the best way to uh, reuse that structure on the site. 
Um, so in this plan, it's sort of it's proposed to be moved uh, to this side. Um, and then there's parking, and then in the back is uh, the new building. This is just an aerial view of the neighborhood. Uh, so this would be the... Um, Sorry, was that the aerial view of the neighborhood? Yes. Again, yeah. Could you point out to all the surrounding houses around the project? Um, so the project is here. This is the existing site. Yep. Uh, there's a house here. Yep. There's a house to the other side. How about houses on, uh, on Green Street? How many are there? On Green Street, uh, there's one house here. There's a large uh, multifamily condo with parking that abuts that. And a couple of houses next to that? There are a couple of houses next to that. And then, Castle Avenue. Is yep, there's a house there. How far away is that from the 10,000 square foot building? Uh, so we're, we're at least uh, 45 to 50 feet away from 40 feet. You're going to put a 10,000 square foot building, three story apartment building. 40 feet from the existing house? No, it's it's uh, 40, 40 to 50 from the property line. Yeah, that's my house. Okay. Yeah. You, want a, you want a three story apartment building 40 feet from your house? Uh, I think we're presenting a conceptual you design do you right want, now. Do you want a 40? So, you excuse want... me, sir. Uh, first of all, nobody at home can hear you because you're not using the microphone. Um, but I think that what we want to do is we want to allow them to have an opportunity to just go through their presentation and then there'll be there'll be time for people to make comments and and have questions but let's let them do their presentation first um, I since this is such a new issue to the Board of Selectmen we just got this uh, on, on uh, Friday um, I I don't think that we're looking to do any making any any recommendation tonight we're just here to hear some information there certainly has to be hearings where there's time for public input and, and for people to work with the developer. And yes, you have to appreciate, if you look around here, everybody in this room virtually is here in opposition to this project. First time we heard about it was Sunday. And the first time we haven't even heard about it. Yeah, well, as I say, we this Board of Selectmen heard about it on, uh, on Friday. Well, apparently they went in front of the Affordable Housing Trust this afternoon. Nobody knew about that. So they're in the process of moving this through without notifying any of the neighbors. We're all here to, to oppose it. Okay. So whenever, and I think you're ready, whenever you're ready to hear our opposition, we're, we're happy to present it. Excellent. Here, here. Yep. There should be a, a, a real opportunity for, for the people of the town to have a say and an input on it. Absolutely. Um, Can I just ask one quick question also? Yeah. Can our you just use the mic so that that allows people to watch it I on. talk really loud. Uh, our neighbor. Um, is hearing impaired. My, I don't know if my understanding was that she was attempting to get an interpreter. She wanted to participate in this in this meeting, and I'm just wondering, given that there isn't anyone here that's interpreting, I'm wondering if that's why that happened, why a meeting would be held without everyone that's in the in the neighborhood able to come and part, at least participate. I don't know. <coughs> don't have a clue about that issue. Don't know anything about it. Um, I understand. Do, are our neighbors able to participate, though, to listen to the introduction? Yeah, she couldn't do that. It's an open meeting, isn't it? Aren't you here presented to the neighborhood? Yeah, give us back. So first, no one here is presented to the selectmen. So you don't care about the neighborhood? Right. No, they don't care. But I think that's right. Yeah. It's, it's at some place. And so why don't we let them uh, do their presentation, and then we'll and then we'll have some I comment. Just say, yeah. Well, we want to have yep. presentation for everybody here. Well, I think that your point was, is taken. There's is certainly a, a densely occupied area in town. I went through this quickly because it's small, and I didn't want to present something that was difficult to it's read. Not important. Uh, I think it's very important, but I think <coughs> I'm, I'm trying to present all aspects of the project. You could have made a bigger picture. Well, we'll have that next time. Uh, this is the view from North Street. Um, the idea conceptually was to create kind of a period style um, structure that uh, would blend in uh, with the North Street neighborhood. Uh, 
we're doing everything we can to keep the scale as small and the mass as small as possible. The third floor of this, uh, which comprises the four smaller units, um, is within the roof line. So uh, we're not building a full three-story building with then another roof on top. Uh, this is just a detail view <coughs> of the main structure. And then some additional <coughs> is what the new building would look like. Twenty-five percent of the units are considered to be affordable. Twenty-five percent of the new twelve units. Twenty-five percent of the entire project. Entire project, fourteen units. Fourteen units. Of the fourteen units, twenty-five percent. So four units. Five. Sorry. Five. five. To, to meet the twenty-five percent, it have to be five. So yeah, you round up. No, you have to round up. No, it's actually units. under four. Right, but twenty-five percent of sixteen is four. Right? Yeah. It's six. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. So we're rounding up to four. Round up to sixteen units. Are any of those four units in two-family houses that currently exist? I'm not sure how they have to be distributed. Uh, normally, uh, affordable units need to be distributed throughout the project. So, like the project that's going up on Hospital Hill, the 48 units, uh, they have to be dispersed within the phases, within the, or the whole project, so they're not lumped into one area. I'm not sure how, how it's uh, going to be required to be in the two-building project. You all may realize this, but because it's a rental, it, I'm not sure what's behind your affordable question. There are affordable units, but because it's a rental, all of the units would count toward our affordable. No, I understand project. how okay. the works. I also okay. understand that the two-family houses that are there now are currently occupied yeah. by, I believe, Mr. McCready's employees who made it clear to me. But I wasn't okay. sure whether or not those two existing units are going to be counted towards the 4D calculation or whether they were going to disperse them among the other two buildings that they're building under this and eight. Well, there's one other building being built for the residential use. The other uh, item was the, uh, the barn being moved for uh, alternative use. They're, one of the things they were considering was using it as, a, as car ports for some of the, the rentals. I, I was reading a letter to Sarah Pose that Could we just, uh, you know, we're, we're losing the microphone use, and that prevents the people that are watching this uh, later to be able to hear and what's being said. What I'd like to do is just finish the presentation, Mr. Hallisey, if you'd like to go ahead and finish your presentation. Then we'll, then we'll circulate the mic, and we'll take uh, comments and questions. Sure. So if David would just want to finish up with uh, <coughs> any uh, site information. Um, so the basic... I guess layout of the building if uh, you're interested. It's um, two units in the front section, two in the back for a total of four, same on the second floor. And then the smaller footprint um, up in the roof line would comprise four of the smaller one bedroom. How many That's bedrooms in the, uh, the eight on the lower two, two floors? Two bedrooms. Two bedrooms, all of them? And how many bedrooms are in the in the units in the front in the house? Yeah. There are three bedrooms. There's three. Um, some of them are pretty small, so I don't know if they can call two or three according to the state. Yeah, two or three. I don't right. know if the affordable would be in the front or the back. There, there, are two or three bedrooms each in the front building. Okay. Um, and I don't know if that would be one of the affordables or, or not. I think we'd be directed to where, you know, if they have to be handicapped, uh, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. So that's what I'm saying. The HCD tells you which ones are the affordable right. ones. At some point, you submit an application, and DHCD will, if not tell, at least strongly suggest what you want to see. Yeah. Uh, anything else, Mr. Hallisey? <coughs> No other questions from the board? No? Okay, uh, public comments then. Please circulate the, uh, the microphone around. We'll start in the back there. 
man with the hat. Can you just, <clears throat> excuse me, can you put the first um, board up that you had that kind of outlines the property? <clears throat> Whereabouts is the, sh um, the barn in relation to that picture? So this is the barn here. Okay. It was, well, it exists right here. Okay. So that, so that structure has to be moved <clears throat> uh, to make the access. Right. No, I, when I first saw the picture, it looked like yeah. that was um, going over onto my property because the barn actually touches my property. Right. So I want to make sure that the driveway, I, p I suppose that's the driveway, um, is not Pete. impeding on my property. Mike, Mike uh, Sullivan's just asking me to a ask everybody to identify themselves. <coughs> Mr. Hatch, could you identify yourself, please? <laughs> Jim Hatch, 99 North Street. Thank you, sir. I couldn't see you at first because you were in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Doug and Meredith Teeny at 111 North Street. I have, has, the, the zoning board is probably the appropriate place for this comment, but I would plead <coughs> for town leadership to please consider stopping the absurdity of burying houses behind houses and multifamilies behind multifamilies. I think there are some real long-term implications that we should think about as a town. And then second, I was reviewing some of the um, zoning regulations on needing 200 feet of frontage on having limitations around 35% of lot coverage. And I was curious how so much asphalt and square footage of structures can meet the lot coverage requirements. And I, I'm pretty confident that the lots on North Street are nowhere close to 200 foot of, of frontage. Are, are you exempt from those requirements for 40B? For, I think it's because it's a 40B that it's pretty much exempt, isn't it, Mark? It, it is exempt, but what should be understood here is I understand this project, and it was alluded to earlier, that it's a local initiative program. So that's what's called a so-called friendly 40B, which means that they're enlisting the cooperation of the town. At the moment, we are in a uh, safe harbor, so we're not obligated to take unfriendly 40Bs for a specified time period. During that time, we have to create additional projects going forward to, to continue that safe harbor. This developer is proposing to work with the town to create housing that will qualify for that purpose. And, but it's up to, ultimately, it's up to the Board of Selectmen to determine whether or not the project is acceptable and, and whether they want to work with the developer or not. So this isn't going to go directly to the ZBA. Okay. So the Board of Selectmen basically is going to ultimately have a policy decision to decide whether the interests of the town in terms of getting continuing the safe harbor and working through the LIP process to, to do this is worth it to the town despite the fact that that clearly has adverse impacts on the neighbors. Yeah, and then final question, I'll, then I'll pass the mic, is will the town consider the broader 40B safe harbor plan and construction plan as part of the approval of, of this plan? It seems appropriate to look at other suitable locations and lots that may help us stay on track with 40B requirements rather than just approving a friendly project because there's an open lot. The, the, town, the town is actively looking at all the sites in town. Uh, there's very active process okay. going on through the Affordable Housing Committee that uh, Mr. Marcucci chairs. Uh, they meet the first Tuesday of every month at 5 o'clock, and uh, um, they, I'm sure they'd welcome anybody to come and okay. watch them do stuff. Uh, but there's, there's a number of irons in the fire in terms of 40B in town. There's, there's, so that we're safe on the 40B front in our safe harbor through the spring, but beyond through May. that we are not. Uh, and, and we have an eight unit lip at, uh, on North Street uh, next to the, the Jacob Cushman house that's been approved now, so that ideally the town would love to have another uh, 20, 13 units somewhere so that we could have another year of safe harbor. I was diagonally across from the post office as we don't know what the Jacob Cushman yeah. house. And just from a procedural standpoint, I mean, the first step is request for Board of Selectmen approval. The second step is through the state, and the state has to approve it. And then just like any other comprehensive permit, it goes to the zoning board to decide. And the zoning board can say yes or say no at that point. 
Gentle people, my name is William Sneed, 84 North, and I have a few questions for Mr. McCready and Mr. McCready. Um, referring to page 11 of your submission, it says, and I quote, existing two family and tenants to remain as is. Now this afternoon, there were eight cars on the premises. So that raises the question, uh, how many families and how many singles are occupying, are occupying the premises of 93 and 95 at this time? Two, two families. How many, two how many adult? Uh, currently, there's two families. One, um, he has three children a wife and three children. The other um, lady, she, I don't know if any of her kids live there. Her brother may live there with her. Um, and there's three bedrooms in each unit, but they're very small. I don't know if they need the state to be called. Uh, are, are there multiple adults living in those units now? Well, house, uh, the husband and wife. Right. And in the front, um, I'm not sure okay. who lives with it. I, I, well, it's so just, it, it, actually, eight vehicles is light uh, for that premise. I've seen several more than that. And it raises the question, how many uh, adults are living there? And how many of them are employees or are, are work-related to uh, the McCready's? Uh, the, the husband... And the other unit. Yeah. I would hope, though, Mr. McCready, that if you uh, were the, the landlord and the lessor of the premises, that you would that, that that any affordable housing would be competitive, that it would not be determined uh, uh, first whether or not they worked for you. Um, I would hope that that would be the case. And, and I would ask you um, uh, why there are eight vehicles on the premises with that, with mostly children living there. I don't know. I don't All right. Well, in answer to your first uh, suggestion about uh, control of uh, deciding on uh, the affordability, who gets to live there, it's my understanding that it's outside of the control, really, of the landlord that uh, there are organizations that we really need to employ that work with the state on how to run lotteries and other means of uh, choosing uh, those particular tenants. Okay. Uh, on, the, on the parking issue, um, you have allocated uh, 21 parking spaces according to your schematic and yet on page 10, when you allocate per unit, you allocate 22 parking places. So somebody gets the short sheet there. Um, if you're allocating 22 parking places and only providing 21, it makes it problematic. But the question, the better question, I think, is who gets the half vehicle? I mean, how are you going to control 21 or 22 parking places when you're allocating one and a half places per unit. Well, How are you going to do that? The one and a half comes by way of the zoning bylaw. That's one of the elements that in the rental units, 1.5 uh, spaces need to be allocated per unit, and that's just the way it is. Well, y yes, sir. The way it is is that. Uh, uh, oh no! What I mean is that's where the 1.5 comes from. So I understand. You're have 1.5 type. I understand, but we're trying to keep it real, and there aren't one and a half vehicles uh, per unit. We don't know how many vehicles there will be. There are eight there now. And the question then is, how are you going to limit to 21 parking places? And where are people going to park if they have gas or if they have more than one and a half vehicles? And that's, that's a question to... Mr. McCready and Mr. McCready at this time. But I think that that's going to be a very real problem with that level of density on that one lot. Um, 
we can look at that. I mean, I'm sure we can make more spaces, but. Well, these are the things that come along with the, as the process goes along. When we deal with the state, when we deal with the town zoning, uh, zoning uh, uh, board, these are the times when those issues will be dealt with. On uh, page eight, you have the estimated percentage of the site used for, and you have building 14.7%. Parking and paved area, 24.9%, and usable open space, 60.4%. Now, is that usable open space permeable? Right, you can probably get a mic. Uh, yeah, that should be where there are no foundations or asphalt, just grass. All right, well, then that's going to require Mr. McCready to dig up all that macadam in the front yard. Am I correct? You will be doing that if you get granted the uh, the uh, the project. I don't understand the macadam in the front yard. Well, there there are several cars parked there uh, in the where you have designated open space on your chart. Oh, that would be all. That would be all taken account. care of, and so now we've got the 21 parking spaces, and you're going to work that out as to where. Uh, how many uh, uh, cars are going to be allowed on the premises? Am I correct? You'll do that. Well, As I said, yeah. part of the process is dealing with all these little detail issues. Yep. You're, yeah. Let me pass the mic on to somebody else. But it is—it's it's not a little detail. Parking is a <laughs> massive problem. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Thank you, folks. Hi, I'm Jonathan Gray. We're at 87 North Street. Um, I understand the, the 40B thing. I mean, no one was more uh, active than us. You know, we had the sign in our yard. I was the second one at the mic, only because I didn't move fast enough in front of the auditorium uh, after Mrs. Rain. And, uh, you know, there were several commas in the uh, contributions to the legal fees. So, you know, that's important to all of us. I do think it's important to strike a balance between a sense of urgency and a sense of panic. And it, it seems like we've, we've kind of crossed the line and we're kind of sticking them every place we can find them if it seems like you know, they're shovel ready and easy to do. Um, but I, I think we've gone a little bit too far. Um, there are several specific, could, could I use your, your diagram? <coughs> There are several specific issues. I mean, we, we just found out about 48 hours ago, so I, I, don't, I don't even have the letter that you guys have. But um, I'm no expert on wetlands, but I know there's a river running underneath here. I know it because it flows through my basement every time it rains, <laughs> which I'm guessing is a tributary to the wetlands over there. Um, I haven't heard any discussion of, of wetlands. Um, any, any project has to go through the ComCom, I think, for even 40 Bs, don't they? For the state. The state. Well, that's protection, yeah. not the, not the bylaw. That would be in front of the CBA. Um, so that's waivable. The local bylaw is waivable. The state is not, and that's and then they will determine it based on uh, delineations on maps as well as vegetation in the field. So I'm not sure. Frankly, uh, an underground stream might be an issue from a. A drainage, a structural standpoint, I'm not sure it's a wetlands issue. Yeah, something to look into. And obviously, as we know, you know, 40 bs can steamroll over all of our zoning laws. So I'm, I'm kind of curious why it goes in front of the ZBA. I guess it does, but they would have no basis to overturn it that I can imagine. Um, one thing 40 bs can't do is change laws of physics. And again, I don't have my T-square and protractor, but that barn goes across my fence. This is not an, this is not the engineered site plan. This is a, a rendered site plan. Yeah, I understand they're, they're beautiful renderings. And you're a gifted architect. I hope to employ you someday, actually. Um, I, I, I do think it's kind of dangerous because the renderings are so beautiful that it makes it look like there's all this room around it. <laughs> Whereas those trees are in the middle of Jim Hatch's driveway. <laughs> so he wouldn't be able to get to the concession stand, which would be a problem uh, for the kids playing baseball. And um, the same thing on the other side. Um, there, there's not all that land around there. There's houses around there. There's structures. And in some cases, as far as I can tell, it'd be less than, t I mean, 
the existing house, which is not moving, right? That's about eight feet from my driveway. So there's a problem with space. And again, I, I don't have the area, but the lot basically runs like this. So I don't see how 65% of that is, is green space. I don't, I don't see that's mathematically possible with this much concrete and that many buildings. The space would have to be the size of this entire thing, right? And again, that's Jim Hatch's house right there where the grill, I think, caught on fire a couple weeks ago. It was put out, nobody was hurt. Um, but there, every single place around here, so there, this green space does not exist. And so that 65%, again, as far as I can tell, it's just not mathematically possible. Um, I, I also think it's important that we have good partners partners that live up to their undertakings. And when Bill Lannon sold this, he held off for almost 50 years selling it because his worst nightmare was something with lots and lots of units going into his beautiful garden. And the only reason he sold it in the end was under the promise that this would be a two-family house and nothing else. So we seem to be going apart from that. And this would, I would guess, involve lots of undertakings with the town. At the very least, the town want to partner with somebody who operates in good faith. And I can tell you the experience we've had as neighbors for the past several years, not to do with the gentleman who lives there, who is a gentleman and a prince, um, but I would guess his employers tell him all the time to park construction vehicles back there, dump trucks, backhoes, bobcats, six days out of seven. For the better part of a year, there was a mound of construction debris, 18 feet tall, and there were lots of emails from John Naff to the owners, which were totally ignored. I can tell you because every single day we looked out our window and my wife was not happy. And when my wife is not happy, <laughs> nobody's happy at home. That's true. Um, so I think there are a lot of problems with this, specific and general. Um, and it does seem like, you know, this is introductory, but it's not. I mean, I did see one little thing from the housing, housing trust, and this has been around there for months, and they're all over it. Um, again, we all understand the 40B thing, you know, that's the big. Uh, that's the big scary monster that all of us want to avoid. But we want to be sensible and we want to plan for the town. And oh, by the way, on the other side, so our house is here, right? Um, again, kind of where the end of the barn is. On the other side, you know, we just got another, what, eight, 12, I don't know how many units, another 50 people over there, another 20, 30, 40, 50 people here. Within the space of a few years, within 100 feet of my front door, we now have 100, 100 people. That's pretty dense not thinking anything about the traffic and the schools and everything else that are important to all of us. Um, I think there are a lot of things here that really need to be deeply thought out. And I, I am a little bit concerned that this got up such a head of steam without people like me, eight feet away, having any idea it even existed. Um, so there is a little bit of, of pent up frustration amongst the abutters. Um, but that's, um, that's my two cents. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, sir. I have a couple of questions. Um, my name is George Michalak, and my wife Holly and I live on 8 Castle Avenue, which is here. Okay. To follow up what, what the gentleman spoke to earlier, we've been watching the clearing of this backyard for about the last eight months or so. Um, and I agree with everything that was said with regard to the mounds, the backhoes, the noise. The fact that anytime you tried to ask anybody about anything, they didn't speak English to talk to you. The fact that they have now dumped all of the residue from the clearing in the 40-foot buffer zone between uh, the property line and my property line. Um, this rendering here fails to show a house here, a house here, a house here, condos here, a house here, a house here. House here, house here, houses over here. Apartment complex over here. Um, this plan is irresponsible. It is inconsistent with the residential area. It's inconsistent with the density. It's inconsistent with the character of the area. It's inconsistent with the traffic problems. We just heard from DPW about having to widen North Street. Add another 22 cars coming in and out of this narrow driveway every day. How does a fire truck get in there and turn around? It's impossible. It's not going to happen. This rendering places buildings on over property lines. This building here 
is a 10,000 square foot, three-story building with three two-bedroom units on the first floor, three two-bedroom units on the second floor, two two-bedroom units on the third floor. I think there are four on the first two floors each, aren't there? No, there are 10 units all together in this oh, building. Okay. All right. right. You know better than I do. I do, because I've, I've read what was submitted to the town planner. I'd be interested to know what is the town planner's view on this? Does she support it or not support it? Would have been interesting to know what her position was. Um, I would ask you. Actually, I'm looking at the at the, the floor plan. It looks to me like there are four units per floor. According to the letter that was submitted to the town planner by Mr. McCready, this is a 10,000 square foot building with 10 units. <coughs> yeah, I, th I thought that there were 10 units in that too, but yeah. I'm looking at a four plan that says that there are four I units per floor. I think originally, originally they were going to have the barn have two units, and they decided that not having the two units in the barn and putting the two in the back building to make it four per floor. What was submitted to the town planner was a 1,000 square foot barn with two two-bedroom units, first and second floor, and then a second 10,000 square foot building containing 10 units on three floors. Yeah, that's what the selection each. got on Friday, too. Okay. But apparently this has changed. Okay. How, how big a lot size is this? Uh, 38,000. Okay. Point eight, 0.8 of an acre. So you're going to put on a 0.8 acre lot two three-bedroom houses, one 1,000 square foot two-unit four-bedroom building, 22 parking spots and a 10,000 square foot building containing 10 two bedroom units. Is that what you plan on doing? That's the initial parking. On, on less than an acre lot? Yeah. And you think that's a responsible plan? Yes. Yeah. And consistent with, the ten, with that area? The, we designed the building in the back to look like a lot of the houses have big Barn, how, many, how, how many buildings in this area here are three story high? Oh, I would say a lot of them. Oh, really? Have you been on Castle Avenue? You know what that looks like? They're one bedroom capes for the most part. One bedroom? No. The one, one story capes for the most part. Correct? No, probably. What do you mean, two, probably? You're the two, developer, two you don't story. know your own project? Castle? It's not, it's not my project. It abuts your project. Don't you think that's going to, that's going to be a yeah. problem for Our people second, on Castle Avenue? If I, what we thought, if rather than moving the current garage and putting it behind the house and putting two units in there, if we utilize, reduce the bedrooms and utilize the third floor, we can move everything. So you four. So you make that you make that building bigger? No, the footprint would be the same. Make the unit smaller. What, what's eliminate the, that and get further away from you. What's the property line of this driveway? Does it is the property line go right next to that driveway? No. Yes, yes. yes it does. Yes it does. Yes it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah. It's about a two foot. Two foot buffer three, before the between the driveway and the property line? Yeah. Is it that, you sure about that? It's not the scale. I know every inch of that driveway. I think it's the same. Yeah. For land. It's impossible for that to be, years. it's impossible for that to be three feet away from the property line. So what I would suggest is that, uh, is that uh, the applicant share the electronic copies of the documents that you're using here tonight with the, uh, the people that live in town. Maybe you can send them into the town and then the town can put them on their website and, People can have access to all of these documents. And so, 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 so the record is clear. I'm here on behalf of my wife and myself. There are a lot of neighbors here who have spoken, many of which have not spoken. We've all spoken to our friends and neighbors. We've spoken to people who own houses, who rent in houses. This is universally opposed. There's not one person in this neighborhood who supports this project. In fact, what this is it has nothing to do with affordable housing. It's a money grab. It's a, it's, a, it's a developer who feels that he's been blocked out by all the other 40B projects in town and is now trying to do a money grab on this particular piece of property. 
that there's no relationship whatsoever to the residential area, character of the area, the density of the area. It's irresponsible. I think the town zoning allows about six or seven units per acre in the RU zone. So this is probably a little more than twice the usual density in the RU zone. Um, but, but I mean, not to, yes, I, I mean, I, I won't argue that's true, but that's true assuming that you obey all the other zoning requirements like setback, right? Sure. And, and this is doing with all those. That's what makes this particularly incongruous, right? Because you're doing away with, you know, again, um, that body of zoning was developed, you know, over a course of time to say that, okay, you can do this, but you can't, you know, max out everything over there, right? Because that, so if all that's done away with, and we've just chucked into there every single unit we possibly can, and it doesn't fit. It seems to be very dense. It does, Mr. Mm -hmm. Gray. Um, any further comments? Yes. Ms. Baylor. Hello. Um, my name is Maria Baylor. I live at 28 Green Street, which is, um, in the neighborhood of this project, I'm not a direct abutter, but I agree with what everyone said about the impact on the neighborhood. But I wanted to um, not comment on the project specifically, but just remind everybody that um, because I was a member of the working group that worked over the past year with the planning board, the historical commission, the zoning board of appeals, to um, come up with the zoning changes that town meeting voted in for the RU district. And those changes were designed to um, make sure that the multifamily uh, dwellings that were being built in the RU district weren't going to continue to have an adverse impact on the neighborhood. So those zoning changes um, scaled back the size of the buildings, um, increased the setbacks, um, and did all kinds of things to make sure that, that the neighborhood wasn't impacted and that we preserved the character of this district. Um, and I just wanted to remind the selectmen of the spirit of those changes. You know, we worked very hard on them. The town voted on them. The town agreed to that. And this project seems to be, um, you know, completely in opposition to the spirit of those changes. And I understand that, th that 40B is outside those zoning changes, but um, I just don't think that, that trying to shoehorn this project into this lot um, makes any sense, and I think it really is going to severely impact the abutters and the entire neighborhood, which is which is what we're really trying to prevent in the RU district. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. My, my good neighbor on, on Castle made me think of a question. Um, he had asked what the city planner thinks about this project, and I, w I was curious what our um, affordable housing committee thinks of the project. Um, I'm a little nervous that you seem in support um, I don't know how the process works. If uh, I'm, I'm curious why abutters haven't been notified and it comes to a, a, a selectman meeting. We're not sure what the process looks like after this. I think it's, it'd be wonderful to post information. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll speak to that with respect to the Affordable Housing Trust. And so what, what we've been doing um, at our meeting since we were formed is kind of reviewing any number of projects that people have proposed. And we have... Uh, we've assigned members to work with particular developers who've come forward with particular projects to um, get a sense of what's being proposed, to get more details about it, to figure out what's going on and whether um, in general and in concept it seems consistent with what we're trying to accomplish. The opinion of the trust on this project was? We have not voted on it yet. Okay. Um, so the first time the trust discussed this uh, just conceptually was at our September meeting. And the conclusion from that meeting was that we asked Mr. McCready to go forward and develop some plans uh, and specifics around this proposal, um, which, he which he did and submitted um, last Thursday or Friday to us and got on the agenda for the selectmen and the agenda for the Affordable Housing Trust tonight. And so before this meeting, this was on the agenda for the Affordable Housing Trust. Again, we didn't take a position on it. We're going to okay. take a position on it potentially, depending on where things are in the process, at our next meeting on November 7th. And we had suggested that we would come back in a month um, after comments. And, and one of the comments we made to Mr. McCready was that he should talk to the abutters and get the views of the neighbors and all of that. And I okay. think, um, and I'll make just sort of two general kind of policy comments, and I'm speaking just for myself and not for either the trust or the board of select. Um, you know, I understand entirely why you all are here. 
right? And I'm, I'm not here to disagree. I'm not going to disagree with anything that, that you said. Um, and, you know, the 40B law puts towns like ours in a very difficult position, right? Puts us in a very difficult position. Um, and, you know, we have tried to, uh, over the course of the last year, to kind of actively manage the town's response to that. And, and part of that is trying to work through these type of proposals rather than waiting to see what comes down the pike. Right. I mean, the, the rationale behind the Affordable Housing Trust, the rationale behind the Housing Production Plan is to give the town some control over what happens. Um, and I, not to quote myself, but I said at town meeting last year that not everybody is going to like everything we're going to do. Right. And so um, I'm very respectful of the fact that all of your positions are well stated. I don't have a position on this yet. I think in concept I thought it was worth pursuing. And I, and I also think, though, we have to be... Uh, respectful and willing to work with developers who are willing to come forward and work with us, right? And part of that process is evaluating the appropriateness of the project and everything else that we have to look at, right? And so we want, you know, we, I, we don't want as a town, from my perspective, to pay for all this ourselves. Um, I don't want to fall out of safe harbor. And the reality is if we fall, out of, if, if this does not go forward um, and we do fall out of safe harbor, it could be back in June. And we'll be back in June under the 40B law and it would kind of be out of the selectman's hands, out of the Affordable Housing Trust's hands, and really out of the ZBA's hands, right? And again, I respect to Mr. Gray's comment, I, I don't think we're panicking. I mean, we have a number of projects that we're looking at. Uh, I anticipate that pretty much every one of them will draw some opposition from some people. Um, I think the Jacob Cushman House project was a little bit unusual in that it didn't really have neighbors, and it was falling apart and it was already next to a giant parking lot and a school and the rest of it. And I think the same is true of the building next to that one. I mean, it's, it's in an area that it, it's kind of, I don't want to say it's an easy one, but, but there's just not a lot of reason to, to object to those. And that's not always going to be true. Um, and so I, I do think we have to be respectful to Mr. McCready and Mr. McCready and, and, and you know, we don't want to react from the town perspective. The, the neighbors, you have to do what you're going to do. But I think from the Board of Selectmen's perspective, we have to be open and receptive to proposals that developers are willing to make. Ultimately, we're going to have to make you know, a policy judgment on this as to whether you know, this is a project we're going to support you know, going forward this year as weighed against the other opportunities we have to achieve the 21 units to give us safe harbor for this year. Um, and, and so I, I, I hear everything that everybody has said. I understand the density of this project and looking at it, it is dense. Um, I mean, I, I, I did think there was an effort by the architect and the developer to make a building that at least looked nice. Now, maybe it's not going to look nice where it is. Uh, but in comparison to some of the buildings that we've seen proposed in similar projects, I think at least in that respect, they've tried to move it in, in that direction. It may ultimately be that it's too dense, it's not the right location, or that there's another project that we find that's going to be a better and, and more appropriate um, one to support in this season, right? So we're sort of in a season now to get to... Uh, approvals by the spring to extend our safe harbor. And that's kind of where we are. And, and so we have eight of them that are likely to be uh, approved and on the SHI uh, by the spring for safe harbor. And we're working to develop that next piece of it. And so um, I, you know, I think we're, we're kind of learning as we go here with respect to this. This is not something the town has ever done. The town has never really had um, an adopted housing production plan. It's never really tried to do this actively. It's just sort of waited to see what happened and you know, get unhappy when it did. And so we're hoping to continue to do this proactively. And I, I do think part of that, at least from the perspective of myself as a selectman, is that we do have to listen to what proposals come down the route and, and we'll evaluate them on their merits. And that's what we're hoping to try to do with all of this. But I, I think the concern about notice to the abutters is one that um, it, we discussed at the trust meeting today. And, and I think we're going to develop some procedures around this that would make sure that at some point in the process there are those those discussions, but I think you know we are at a preliminary meeting here, and, and you know these specific plans, um, you know they're not we not like we've had them for six months um, at this point. So yeah, no, no, thank you, Mr. Marcucci. The only the only ask I would make to all the considerations that you're, you're doing as a trust is the broader context, and it seems like we're on a pattern of North Street that might be nice to break and, and spread um, density. <coughs> A little more reasonably. Not, not all of the properties that the Affordable Housing Trust are, uh, are looking at are on North Street. No, I understand that, but we've, we've, we're on a run. On yeah, at the street. moment we yeah, are. We're right, on a run. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. The ones that are built are here. And, and in some ways, I mean, the downtown is, is a more logical place to put things that are 
that are somewhat more dense. And so that I, I tend to agree that I think that the two that Mr. Borelli is doing on North Street are, are perfect because of the fact that they're in the downtown. Uh, it's, it's nice to have that rental density in the downtown and there aren't neighbors there. Um, so that, uh, so there's nobody that's really objecting to the change in the neighborhood th at that site. There, you know, there aren't those sites everywhere in town, unfortunately. Right. And so here's where the rubber meets the road where we've got a, a policy issue on the one hand and a neighbor Hood that uh, doesn't like the prospects of, of the density on the other hand. Um, so that, uh, okay, you want to go ahead with your question? So I was just going to ask, um, I guess this is to Russ, so to, what, what's the plan for the management of this building once it's built in terms of who's going to handle the leasing, who's going to manage? It? Apart from the, you know, the affordable units have to go through the state approved lottery process and I assume there'll be a reservation for a Medfield resident at least one of the affordable units. But with respect to the management of the buildings, this is a fairly, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty big apartment building overall. Um, and and the, it looked like the prior, you know, the previous experience that Mr. McCready has had has been in, in sort of build the cell uh, projects as opposed to build a rent project. So who is going to handle the management? Because I, I, I take to heart the comments about handling the town. Mean, that's a, you know, there's, there's, a, sure. there's a skill well, involved. Uh, you know, Dave and his uh, sons have been involved with, as builders for a long time. Uh, they've had a lot of building with house, single family houses, as, you, as most of you know. But also, uh, they've had uh, uh, commercial office space uh, buildings that they've had along the way too for a long time. Uh, so, and they've kept the management and maintenance of those buildings uh, within their companies. And, you know, and the Avenue building that they, that they recently uh, renovated and, and have up and running uh, now um, with the restaurant on the first floor and then office space and, and such on the second and third floor, which as I understand is pretty much all fully rented at this point. So they do have a history of and experience with uh, managing the properties that they own for a long time and, and maintaining them. But not, not residential properties, I mean commercial buildings. Um, we have some residential. Well, the experience and the history of maintaining that property, just to say that the specific history that I think relates to that project is that property. And if you go back and look through the email files of John Naff and see the emails that were sent week after week, month after month, year after year, about a 20-foot slag pile and a backhoe and a, you know, construction equipment everywhere, which I'm quite sure is against zoning regulations, and it's not a 40B project yet, right? So those things should have been obeyed. And when you got something from the town saying, can you please remove the 20-foot pile of construction debris, that something actually happened at some point over the course of years. Did not happen. So our history, our experience of that property has not been one that was well-maintained or well-managed. So I'm, I'm curious, as, could I just have a show of hands of how many people here are neighbors of this property? So maybe 20 people? It looks like. people left. Yeah, I, I assume that they were, uh, uh, enough, enough of the, are, are any of you in favor of this project? Are any of you against it? Yes. yes. Okay, we're against. all against it. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think that, this, I mean, this is gonna be a process. Uh, as I say, the selectmen just got this material on Friday, um, uh, so that uh, I don't think the selectmen are in any position to take a position on it at all now. We've I've, I've heard the neighbors speak in a, in a uniform voice that uh, that you don't like it and uh, and the density is wrong, and so that the town's going to have to consider that. I think. Yes, sir. Uh, Dave Knott and Charles Dale Road. When does the um, safe harbor? Expire. I know Medfield Meadows is back for round two. Uh, May. I'm assuming they're waiting for it to expire. So when when does that expire? May of 2018. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Comments? Before we break, I'll apologize for the term little details. I didn't realize what I was saying and uh, apologize for that term. Except so thank you all for coming. We're now an hour and a half behind on our <laughs> schedule. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Hallisey, could you just get the town uh, electronic copies of all the th all the things that were submitted so that the people can see them?
And I think that will be a good start for uh, people to get the information. Get it to Christine or, or Sarah? Either one of us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the gavel. <laughs> Richard used to have a gavel. I don't know where he got it from. So we're going to hear now from Jean Minio uh, of the... Uh, who's requesting selectman support for the reuse of the chapel at the hospital site at the Arts Center. Sorry to keep you so late, Jean. I'll be brief. That's my uh, so thank you. Uh, I am Jean Video here from the Cultural Alliance of Medfield with Jerry Potts. There are several members of the Master Planning Committee um, for the State Hospital here as well. And I'm here to ask for a letter of support for the concept of the Cultural Center in the Lee Chapel and the Infirmary at the State Hospital. Uh, as a reminder, we're looking at the chapel to be renovated for multi-purpose performing arts uh, center and the infirmary to be renovated for approximately 11 classrooms, which vary in size from about 175 square feet to about 600 square feet. Uh, this would support music from its creation to the presentation, uh, dr uh, drama, drama and related performances, potentially lectures, films, readings, those kinds of things. There's two lawns, one on the east and the west. Each one is approximately a uh, just under half of an acre, but that would allow for some engagement, outdoor uh, activities and events. Um, we've been building to this point for the last two and a half years. The cultural community identified its needs and vision for this opportunity in its 2015 report. The wider community has asked for both preservation of the chapel specifically, but also for cultural programs and especially for keeping public access and engagement on this property. Uh, in its three surveys that the Master Planning Committee did and its subsequent public meetings since 2015. We have confirmed uh, demand and that it's a viable solution with our architectural feasibility study that was presented in April of this year. And we know from the June report that the arts do contribute to the economic prosperity and job growth within our community to the tune of about $3.1 million of economic activity in a given year returning $224,000 to state and local governments and supporting the equivalent of 125 full-time jobs. Um, and the Master Planning Committee has, um, has this cultural hub, this cultural concept, this reuse of these particular buildings in their preferred use plan. And within this past month, the consultant for the project, the McCabe Enterprises, uh, has um, stated their belief that this cultural hub would be important to be, if not first in, then very early in the development of the um, entire project, uh, in part because it would increase the value of the rest of the property and the town would ultimately realize more revenue and it would also be helpful to attracting developers to what we know is going to be a rather difficult um, and challenging project. So the Master Planning Committee is in its iterative stage of developing its complex financials and finding an acceptable use, uh, acceptable mix of uses there. We're driving toward a special town meeting in March. But in the meantime, uh, McCabe Enterprises has advised that we, the Cultural Alliance, really begin to gear up for our capital campaign and that we start applying potentially for tax credits, which might take a year or two to achieve, but it would be critical for any aspect of the overall development where preservation is uh, involved. We do have an outline of sources for the capital outline. We're developing the pro forma and we're working with two members of the warrant committee on this. There's a lot more work yet to be done before there's an actual plan, but our challenge and the amazing opportunity here really is to build something from scratch that can meet our community needs with local expertise. And at this time, the Cultural Alliance is committed to leading the process for this cultural hub. We're building the board we're, and our network, our strategy, and our early funding. Um, there are some deadlines for funding coming this fall. And toward that end, um, we're looking, we, we really will ultimately need two things to move ahead. One will be some infrastructure, and the second thing will be a commitment. It's early for the commitment, but um, we have had discussions with uh, members of the uh, Board of Selectmen in terms of conceptual support for this. We're asking for you to simply formalize that kind of support in a letter. 
We're also collecting these letters from uh, local organizations, including Zulo, the library, Lowell Mason House, potentially the Master Planning Committee if they're meeting tomorrow. Uh, we also are uh, meeting with the other cultural councils of the adjacent towns, Millis and Walpole and other surrounding towns. So while there's local benefits to this kind of a project, there is certainly regional interest. Um, and so with that, I will just uh, thank you for considering the request and offer to answer any questions. Questions? Sure. I guess my initial question is sort of why now? I mean, there's no master plan. There's no zoning. It's not been sold. There's no RFP. I mean, it, seemed, it strikes me as odd that we're going to pick out and support a specific use and start raising money for a specific use of one building <coughs> Some property yeah. rather than kind of having a master plan to define what's going to happen on the whole property. So right. why now? Well, some of that is because of the deadlines that are coming um, for potential funding. And what, what, what deadlines for what? Oh, so for the uh, Mass Cultural Facilities Fund, for example, would uh, potentially fund some additional feasibility. There's, a, uh, you know, as I said, there's more work to be done in terms of uh, design and even planning for, the, for what the funding would be. Um, and is that an annual deadline, semi-annual deadline? It's an annual deadline. It'll be January. So it'll this come up year. January of next year too. Yes. Again. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, the delay on those. I mean, grants are never a quick process. So you might find out six or eight months later. So you will have lost almost another year in the process of getting your initial ducks in a row for that. So I can't imagine that they would actually, uh, quite frankly. Um, without some sort of a bigger commitment like these letters of support from organizations beyond the Cultural Alliance, they're, they're not going to be likely to make an investment. And what does that commit us to? I mean, if we give you the letter you want of support, what are, what are we committed to then with the state? Are we going to tell the state that, that the town has concluded this is the use for this building and we're committing to do that? Um, no, I think similar to a draft that I have from my... Um, that will be circulated with the master planning committee. It's really um, just outlining some of the reasons why you would support this kind of a reuse in that in that particular property. I, mean, I guess my concern is, though. I mean, I, I don't want to make. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think I'm in a position at this point to say this is what we're going to use Lee, Lee Chapel for. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're going to apply to the state, and the state is going to be asking for us to commit to say. This is what we're using the Lee Chapel for. I, I would not, you know, that, that would have a certain binding no. effect on me anyway. Right. Whereas I wouldn't want to say to the say, hey, you gave us this grant, we've changed our mind. Now, if all you're asking for is support to make a grant for a feasibility study, I mean, that, that seems reasonable. But I, I, I think it's, I find it odd that we would be, be making this kind of request or taking this kind of position with the, with the master planning process incomplete. Mm -hmm. that, that just seems odd. Jerry Potts, 7 Kerr Street. So I serve on the board of Club Passim in Cambridge. We've gone through this process before. So applying for that, you still have to raise a matching grant. So it isn't they write you a check and you go off. You have to raise an equal amount, which to me provides us an opportunity to directly determine, not theoretically what money is out there, but to do a capital campaign where you've got matching dollars. So, you know, in, in a lot of ways, the feasibility for this is can we raise, if it's a quarter million dollars that the Mass Cultural uh, Council feasibility is supporting, we then can go out and raise money. And the sooner we do that, the sooner we're going to be able to give answers to the, to the, to the planning committee on how feasible this is. Because everything's theoretical until you start putting money. So, unfortunately, the sequence is there has to be some commitment from the town that there's an interest. The state comes in and is willing to fund it, but they're saying only if you raise it. Well, we can't get to that point until we get a commitment from the town. We can't start trying to raise money for this project and going out unless we have some, again, not final commitment, because then we have to actually go out and, and fund it. But, um, but the dominoes for this, if we want to start moving on this, are, are kind of now. Um, we're going to want answers in March when we go you know, uh, in front of the town. If we've got a half a million dollars in, in private funding for this and we have a match from the state, it's going to be a lot easier to show that there's viability. 
So for a commitment letter that really just means we can start the process of being serious about raising money and not sitting in meetings talking about maybe someday money's gonna fall from the sky, this gives us a real plan that we can actually go out and execute on. Does the hospital committee support this? Uh, they, uh, Steve Nolan has started a draft of the letter. They'll be looking at that tomorrow. Steve's here. Steve's here. <laughs> I mean, it has been included, the concept of this has been included in their preferred use master plan now um, and, and for the last, well, since the spring. Um, I, th I think it actually, I struggled a little bit with the letter, partly in response to the same concerns that Mr. Marcucci is raising about not getting the cart before the horse. But I, I drafted a letter that I'm going to circulate to the Master Planning Committee to take a sense of the committee. As, as Jean said, the, the plans, the draft plans, show a cultural facility at the Lee Chapel. And it's been part of our planning to, to do that. One of the big concerns has been financing for it and, and the discussion we've been having about you know, is that on budget, is it off budget? Um, and I think there's a, a lot of sense that the, the weight of that cost would be too much for the hospital to bear, given a lot of other costs we're struggling with. So we've been um, supportive of the idea of the fundraising campaign to try and raise resources for that project. And, and as Gene said, there are various deadlines. Another one is state historic credits, which get allocated out in little bits of 200,000, 300,000 at a time, so it takes a while to accumulate those. And our consultant has said, you know, the sooner you get in line to start accumulating those, the better off you'll be. So um, in the end, I, I drafted this letter, which is sort of a soft letter. You know, it says it, it reflects that our draft plan includes the cultural facility. Um, it specifically mentions that it's subject to town meeting vote and approval of the final plan, which we're in the process of developing. So it's not uh, you know, a total commitment in any sense. It's a, definitely a soft uh, a letter, but at least it does um, suggest that the committee is behind the idea of a cultural facility up at the state hospital. And it hasn't been approved yet by the committee, but hopefully we'll vote on that to come uh, Jack Wolf, 17 Harding Street. Uh, let me kind of share the concerns, Mike, that I think you and Steve both noted which is this hasn't yet been approved by the Master Planning Committee and therefore to ask the selectmen to approve it a priori seems to me to be a little bit uh, inappropriate at this time. I would also say that we have looked and there are, as Steve mentioned and as Gene mentioned, there are some fairly significant financial issues to be resolved at the Medfield State Hospital as yet. And I think part of those have to do with the issues in and around the quote unquote cultural corner. So it's not the only set of issues, but there are broad financial issues that need to be addressed. And I would just suggest that it might be best to hold on a letter until those issues have been addressed and at least partially resolved. Gus, questions? Uh, actually, I think I have a few comments more than questions. Gene and I have had a number of discussions over the probably almost at least last six or eight months about this. Um, it, when I, in the, one of the last discussions we had, uh, I'm glad Steve's in the room because my first apprehension was the selectmen take a position that basically we're not helping you out if the selectmen start telling the committee or at least tell the committee where we're at before the committee has figured things out. So I'm, I'm taking your positive comment, recognizing that tomorrow would be a, the earliest the committee would approve that soft letter, but I'm at least taking that as a tentative comment that if there was a soft enough commitment here from this committee, that would not be seen as something that the committee would find objectionable or interfering. So I'm taking that off the table pending the discussion tomorrow night. Uh, I'll make, and, and Jack, to your point, I, I get all that you're saying, but I'm also hearing Gene saying this is something that isn't going to happen very quickly. Uh, and if I understand, Jerry, what you just said, and this is something which is simply looking at working through the feasibility stage of this thing. So this is not signing a construction contract. It's not committing money to doing anything. It's it's making a commitment that might enable you all to get grant money that would get the early stage thinking going. Correct. I'm pretty sure if 
the committee, the hospital committee, decided that every single building on the hospital property needed to be taken down and plowed under. The one building that a good number of people in this town would stand up for is the Lee Chapel. Uh, and for that reason, leaning a little bit forward in the saddle around extending a commitment to simply take a, an early and harder look at the Lee Chapel, to me, it, it does, it's counter to where it'd normally be, but it doesn't bother me on this one because I think this is going to be a somewhat arduous process. Jack, to your, your point about financing, I put the Lee Chapel in the same category I put Parks and Rec. That is not a foregone conclusion that this is a tax levy burden. Maybe the townspeople are interested enough, it's a partial boost by a tax levy, I don't know. But I don't think either one of those should be judged up front by whether or not the taxpayers will agree to this. I think we need to push on things like this that are discretionary. Uh, we need to push the people who want them to look at alternatives because there are people in town who will care enough and they will contribute to it. <clears throat> and there may even be people outside of town who will do it. The other point I'll make in, in my having seen what Gene's done by way of legwork <clears throat> to just validate the concept and more importantly to me, flesh out some of the hard-nosed business questions about is this going to be a permanent drain, is there a way of making this work? <clears throat> For this earliest stage in the process, I think Gene has done more to vet the concept, to work through some of the hard business issues than we've probably done on any other piece of that property. So. Um, for those reasons, A, it's partly that I'm confident the thinking that's going into this is the kind of disciplined thinking that needs to go into it to make it work, to convince, you know, to get people maybe to, to donate to it or however the funds get raised and then not screw it up even if you get it. I have more confidence that that could happen. So if that letter of commitment that you're looking for is a letter of commitment that will help you put in applications for grants for the early stage feasibility, right. and if the hospital, you know, you, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, Steve, but if there's nothing about us <coughs> considering doing that that cross-threads us with the committee, and if Steve or somebody could give us a draft of that soft commitment that, that would be what you'd want us to say, then I certainly would be prepared to consider that, because I don't see it as like a, a locking the town into a commitment, mm -hmm. but I do see it as something that could accelerate maybe by a year, and where we could work on this. It was meaningful to me when Kathy McCabe, at the, I think it was the last meeting, came up and said, you know, I'm actually convinced now that doing something with the chapel and this cultural center will actually add value to everything around. I, I hadn't been thinking of it that way. I kind of said, you got to build all this other stuff and then you'll finally be able to get to this nice to have thing. The fact that she saw it that way as something that could actually add value to the entire property, certainly moved my needle over a few notches around being willing to also support it on strict business grounds. Um, that's what I uh, Yes, Mr. Rogers. <clears throat> Gil Rogers, I'm on the Master Planning Committee. A, a few points. <clears throat> the committee has not agreed that the Cultural Center will be in that area. It's certainly been discussed but there's been no decision that that's what's going to be done. It's been an idea. There's lots of ideas. It's been an idea. But that has not been decided yet by Kathy or by the committee. Second point is I don't think that the Board of Selectmen should go around in predetermining uses or implications for uses of the buildings before the Master Planning Committee has made those types of decisions. I think it's just premature. It's a, Heart in front of the horse. Third point is I'd agree with Gus and Jack, okay, that this should be treated financially as an off-balance sheet project, just like the park and rec facility. It should stand on its own two feet and not be sort of mushed into the economics for the overall campus. That has to be decided as well. I've been arguing that that has to be a decision that we deliberately make before we can make any decision about the uh, cultural center. And the last point I want to make is the economics of it are critical. Uh, Gene and I have studied probably half a dozen other cultural centers in the area. None of them are profitable. They're all losing money. 
They take subsidies and support and grants and foundation funds in order to make them economically viable. So before we make a decision on that, I think we have to have a good understanding of what the economic basis for it and if it'll support it. Bill, can I just ask a question and a follow-up? First off, I'll modify my position pending tomorrow night's discussion. I, would, I don't think we'll be writing letters before that anyway, just to be clear. The, the, if I'm hearing Gene Wright and Jerry Wright, this would, what this could lead to is funding for a feasibility study. So to your point about some of the economics not being thoroughly proven out, is there a reason why going after that kind of funding is harmful to this process? Now, I think that the main thing is, I don't think that it's appropriate for the board to de facto make a decision or make a judgment that that's the use, the decided use on the hospital, um, chapel and infirmary before our committee has made that sort of determination. And that's what I'm concerned with is a letter um, is going to make that sort of um, implication, and that's what I think is inappropriate. So that was that was the issue I was sensitive to. Uh, okay. So while I, I agree, no decision has been made. All of the plans that have been approved, at least to the final point of the, the recommendation, all of them included a cultural center in the Lee Chapel. The question that's come up repeatedly is the funding of that. And so what we're recommending is an approach that allows us to go to market similar to the Catalyst Committee where you went out and talked to you know, not making a commitment on any of these. If we don't raise money and we can't raise money, we have a pretty good indication it's not a viable project. So being able to apply for the grants, again, it is a matching grant. If we can't raise money from private sources to do it, but no private source is going to even think about doing it if there isn't some level of commitment. It, it, you know, it, it, hey, monorail, you know, I'm Jerry Potts. Fund the monorail. I got nothing, right? There's nothing that says there's even an indication of that. So we could hedge this language however you want it, pending matching funds from private, but we don't have anything to be able to go out that's tangible right now to even gauge the level of interest to a, to a specific dollar amount. And what the state would do uh, the cultural uh, feasibility, the, the capital would actually have a fixed dollar amount that we need to raise the exact same amount. And if we can't do that, it doesn't move ahead. So, Jack? Thanks, Pete. Uh, there are two questions involved. And clearly, Jerry has addressed one of them, as has Gene, which is the issue of the capital costs. I think there is some understanding that the capital costs are fairly substantial and that external fundraising is one good potential option for that. But let me add the other side. There are operating costs beyond that. It seems to me that unless we are sure that the operating costs ongoing to the point that Gill made are going to be feasible, substantial, the town supports the use, it will pay for a cultural center up there. There's no good building that cultural center. So it would seem that the operating costs need to be assured first, and then we ought to decide that we ought to have a capital investment to achieve those operating costs. So that's point one. Point two, Gus, uh, know that Martha and I have had a conversation with Kathy. We are the people who initiated with her the question of, gee, will the presence of the cultural corner raise the value in total? We've asked her for some numbers on that a couple of times. Nothing has come forward. So she may feel that, but there is nothing definite that says that that's so. Um, Jerry Potts, seven Kurt, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I've been, since 2002, on the board of a nonprofit arts organization. I'm now chair of that board. It's a $1.5 million a year organization that is fully in the black, that puts on 400 shows a year, that runs a school of music. So we're in the process of putting... It's in Cambridge, and I fully understand, but we also have uh, sister organizations. I have friends at Berkeley College of Music, uh, Swallow Hill. Uh, there are arts organizations throughout the country that are doing just fine. And there's an operating budget, and there's also fundraising that's associated. 
if you've seen what, if you work with Gene, what we're in the process of doing right now is putting exactly what you're talking about. What's a reasonable ramp up on operating, you know, both expenses and revenue. And I have 33 years in business. So, you know, I, when I came in 2002, we were losing money at that scene. And we now have been in the black. So, you know, I love the town and I love the arts, but if, it, if we can't find a viable way to show revenue and expenses that cover itself, then it's a pipe dream. And I pay taxes as well. So all we're asking for is the opportunity to put the best case forward to make that asset as valuable as it can be for the town. And you're asking all the right questions really on all of this. This is an initial step. And we have lots of places we can fail on this, right? We, we could fail within the first month, right? We go out and talk to people even with this level of commitment, they go, what? So, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do behind this. And all I can say is we'll do it diligently and we'll do it responsibly for the town, but we can't start doing it. And I've attended these meetings for two years. I love the fact you guys have spent so much time thoughtfully thinking about this. Here's a chance for us to start moving without a commitment. There's no, you know, shovel going in, but we can go out and, and seriously gauge level of commitment to fund something like this. At the same time, we're also doing the financials to make sure it's viable. So, completely understand it. My, my dream and my goal, and I've said this to Gene, is to try to raise as much of the money privately as possible, because I think that's honestly the best way to do this. Um, and if we can't do that, I, I don't, whatever the value is for the, the state hospital, I, I, knowing what we have, the demands that we have in town, I don't know how we could even think of going in front of the town with some of the numbers that have been talked about for this project, unless we can show a win. So, I, you, hear. you know, I'm just asking, let's start the win process. And, and if we can't convince, I know you'll be at every meeting looking at the financials, if we can't surpass that threshold and reasonable people don't think it's viable, then it shouldn't move ahead. The town is grateful for your contribution of the first million, Jerry. Thank you very much. I'll try to raise it. <laughs> Hey, Jack, Jack, if I could just respond to yours. I, um, this town knows really well how to hold off doing anything while we think longer about it. And I, the reason I ran for this office is I've got very little patience for that. Uh, so where I'm coming from on this, understanding that this is not us all taking out a second mortgage on our house this isn't sitting there signing some 30-year you know, note for $17 million. This is simply a letter that enables these guys to go out and get the early funding to be able to look harder at this concept. With, by the time, Gil, by the time the committee decides, assuming it's decided by a March special town meeting, if they get the money and the committee decides not to do it, all you do is return the check. Because the time it's gonna to take to get the funding is, is like that. If there were commitments, if there were strings, if there were binding constraints on the master planning committee, I would feel totally different about this. Mm -hmm. But as long as none of that's there, and this is something which is merely enabling funding for this to move ahead, if the committee and the town agree to move ahead with it, I'm looking at it as something that gets the ball started six months earlier because six months from now, there will be yet another reason why we need to take another six months to look at another aspect of this before we do it. So I, I see, I respect, to, to your point, I don't want, I'm, I'm coming back hard on you, there's only one thing I don't want to come back hard on. If us doing that sticks our nose in the decision-making of the committee, then as much as I feel that way, I do not think we should do that. I don't feel like that's us doing that, given the lack of any commitment or strong ties what this all leads to. So if the committee just says, no, we've got a better idea, we're going to turn it into a, I don't know, a Halloween costume shop, because it's a little spooky in there, whatever, then that's the way it goes, and we, we pull the plug on this. So that's where I'm coming from, is we just find ways to sit there and think longer and harder and do nothing. And this is maybe a chance, because this is going to be, I'm guessing, I don't know, Gene, you can tell me. I'm guessing we don't see this in 10 years, no matter what we do, or five, five years, six years. Okay, six. Uh, you know, what I'm getting at, this is not something that we're going to be sitting there having the ribbon cutting on in 2019. This is a big deal. If this is a way we can get it started six months earlier, and, and we're not 
locking ourselves into an unacceptable commitment, then I don't see the harm. So all I need is a letter. And we're not hacking off the state hospital master planning committee, including me. So I was concerned about uh, stepping on the toes of the state hospital committee myself. Um, I, I think that, um, I guess, I'll, I'll back up and start at the beginning for me, which is that I, I tend to think that the uh, uh, cultural center at the hospital is going to be a, a win for the town. I think the town will like it. I don't think the town is going to want to pay for it. Um, and so that's going to be a problem for the town, I think. Um, and I think that the cultural center will add value to the rest of the property up there. I think it'll make the, the rest of the development worth more. Um, I, I was involved in, in the LaSalle College building LaSalle Village. The educational tie-in of LaSalle Village is what added a huge amount of value to that. I see this adding value to the, the hospital in the same way. The educational part of LaSalle Village is what made people want to come there. Um, they didn't have to advertise for years because they, they were just sought out by the public that wanted to move there to take part in the classes. I mean, they paid a quarter of a million dollars a year, I think, when I was back uh, involved to, to run the educational component, so it wasn't, it wasn't without cost, but uh, it was, instead of spending their money on, on advertising, they were spending the money on, on running the educational component. Um, I think this is gonna have huge uh, impact, uh, and I think it's gonna huge, have benefits that are gonna flow across the town if we end up pulling it off. Um, but I don't know that, I, I just don't think, and for me it comes down to the numbers. I, I don't know that the town's going to support the, the, the payment for it. I can't commit to, to us to a course that commits us to paying for it at this point. But I think that the, the letter is fuzzy enough that I guess I've been, I've decided that I'm okay with it to get you guys going in terms of raising some monies and, uh, and trying to move, move it forward. Because if the funding doesn't come from the town, then it's just not going to happen anyway. Uh, and in terms of the stepping on the toes of the committee, I guess it's going to be such a fuzzy thing that if the committee decides they don't want to, to recommend it, I think that it's going to die anyway. So uh, whether we express our opinion tonight, I was thinking we could wait and hold off for two weeks, but I don't know that it's even important to do that because uh, it's, if, the, if the committee doesn't support it, then I think it's going to die anyway. So. Mm -hmm. Bill? Well, let me suggest, okay, that since the committee, the master planning committee, has the responsibility of at least proposing a plan and presenting it to the board, and we're having a meeting tomorrow, that what we do before we make any decision about this is have this um, discussed tomorrow night mm -hmm. and see what the committee feels. I mean, I feel strongly about it. I agree that the financial aspect is one of the most important aspects of it. I'm a big supporter of a cultural center, so I've done a lot of work on it myself. But I think that unless we really come to grips with both the capital costs and what it involves, and I'm sure it's a big number, and to see if it operationally can be a net winner, unless we can see that, then we ought to hold off in making a decision on this. And I think that since we have a meeting tomorrow and then another one in two weeks, you know, take advantage of that before we make any judgment about it. Miguel, another question. First off, I, I absolutely think we don't make anything in total. You've had a conversation tomorrow. If I'm hearing this right, though, when you say, well, we need to see whether operationally it will make sense, if I'm understanding what you're trying to get for funding, I'm wondering how the committee will make that determination in the absence of funding. If this funding is to actually do a legitimate full-up job of that assessment, then this is actually, the, it, it, again, no commitment, no firm decision, but this is the funding, it seems to me, the town needs to be able to conduct the assessment to figure out whether that, the operational question you're raising, can be answered in a, in a satisfactory way. I mean, you know how, I mean, you would do a pro forma analysis to see what the, what reasonable assumptions are about revenues and what reasonable assumptions are about cost. Mm -hmm. All I've seen is the marketing study that was done, which has many, many, many wild assumptions in it. So I would say that what you do is you do a reasonable pro forma analysis of costs and revenues. That's, it. that's being, being done right now. Who's, who's going to do it? Before, do who's before do we it make when, a decision. Okay. Who's going to do it? When, my question though, Gil, is who's going to do it? When will it be done by? and who's paying for it. Well, I understand you're doing something. We, we are. Well, 
so even if we show an operating budget that shows it breaks even, if we have no way of funding the original capital to actually build the facility, what's the point? I mean, if, if, if the operating is a break even or above and adds value, which honestly is probably what it's going to be, it's not going to be a money maker. The question comes, how do you fund the original building, all the renovation? So what we're asking you to do is do a feasibility not on the operating. We'll get operating numbers. That's actually the easiest thing to do. The hardest thing to do is look at private sources of funding to see if there's capital available and, in, and investors who will be part of a capital campaign to fund this thing so that the town isn't on the hook. So what we're asking is half of it comes from the state. We have to raise, again, let me, let me be clear about it. Getting the mass cultural grant is a matching grant. You do not get that money unless you raise it. I don't think we're asking the town to raise that amount. We're trying to go out and find donors. So the commitment letter here is really us to do a lot of hard work to get real numbers so that in March we can make a real decision, not just we think it's a pro forma and we made some guesses, but We've got $2.5 million of real money that, that we've been able to find very significant donors who are willing to do it. If we can't do that, this thing's never going to get off the ground. So the pressure's on us to come back really with the numbers on the, on the, on the feasibility. But may I ask a, a question before uh, Mr. Wolf? Uh, if the deadline for the application is January, is there any chance at all we're going to get the grant before March? I mean, it, 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 we may not have a March special town meeting, but is there any chance at all that we have a have that grant in hand? I mean, it, it, no, if but, that's the but rationale. That's not that the only want... grant. So, I mean, there's other ones we'd like to go for this fall. Right. And I mean, we've it, got one funder who's got an application now who would like to do a site visit this month. So that's why we're pushing early. Right. And and, and I will say I I I'm persuaded by Gus and you and Jerry um, that we should do this and support you um, in doing this, but. Um, I just don't think we should sell it as this is something we're going to get back before the potential March town, special town meeting. I mean, it sounds to me if that's the goal, it's too late, right? I mean, we need to be... be well, we can talk to donors before. Right. Yeah. So, and, and we will. So, in other words, if we know we're funding this, we then go out to donors and say, we've got this matching grant. Are you willing to entertain this in a serious way? I mean, it, it just puts a framework to it. That it's not... Hey, Gina and I think a cultural center is really good. Yeah, no, yeah, we don't. Yeah, we don't really have anything that says the town wants to do it. But come on board, you know, right. give a half a million, you know. Right. We'll name this you know, room after you, right. Marcucci way. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Only a half a million. That's it for that. Just yeah, a half so, million. Uh, You're making no. money. Huh? You'll need eight rooms. Yeah. <laughs> Free admission for the kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, we lose money. Yeah, you'd be out of business. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be done. They'd be done. Um, so, I mean, I, as long as this is not seen, and I, and I think where I disagree with, with Gil is that we're not making a decision, right? I will say that I, I will support this letter, and I will feel entirely unconstrained to say, you know what, McCabe came back and said that's the most valuable building to be an office building, mm -hmm. and that there are corporations that want to put a corporate, head, preserve the Lee Chapel, but they want to put a corporate office building in there, yep. and say, you know what, that's way better, someone else is going to pay for it, as long as you're not going to be civil, the selectmen have now decided where no, you're no, going. No. This is, but, you know, whether it's a soft letter of support, a show of support, a tepid letter of support. <laughs> I mean, whatever letter of support you need to get over the hump with the grant, I'm certainly willing to sign. But I, I'm not going to take that as a commitment that even if you can raise the money, we're going to conclude that's the best use for it. Understood. Because it may well be that the best use for it is going to be a commercial office building or something else, or a laboratory or something else that preserves the chapel but has much more viable economic use to it. So just with that caveat, that. Yeah. whenever this makes it to YouTube, the record of that, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm certainly willing to, 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 to offer a show of support. Oh, my Amazon Eastern Headquarters, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Somehow I don't think we're going to get ahead of Boston. Worcester, that. Uh, we've got 50,000 employees up there anyway. <laughs> I think we could find a way to live with it, Mike. <laughs> so I guess the answer is that you have a, a consensus show we're willing to do a letter, a soft letter. We don't letter. get anybody an answer tonight in less than half an hour, so we're going <laughs> to <laughs> so We'll see what the committee says tomorrow, right? Yeah. Look, if the committee comes back and says that this is going to ruin their lives and make their life difficult, we'll, it's off the we'll, table. Recons well, we'll reconsider. Okay. Um, but for now, I think that a show of support is warranted. <laughs>
recognize Thank you were waiting for that, Gene. Is, it, is there a draft? You know, there's a, you don't have to exactly, but is there some model we could work from or something that covers the points? Uh, if the committee Steve's votes thing. favorably tomorrow, I think we the could share Steve's. that one. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, citizen comment. We finally got into the citizens. No comments. Okay, good. <laughs> Action <laughs> items. I, I we... think the citizens had comments. <laughs> 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 For the record, nobody signed up. <laughs> nobody signs up again. Well, you know, uh, our um, constituents are flouting our policies. <laughs> I guess I had one thing that I wanted to ask, and it's actually asked for you, Steve, when you're finished. Uh, but I, I did hear uh, Kathy McCabe say that we should get in line for the historic tax credits, and and so it seems to me that she's telling the, the town that we should be filing something right away. Is what I understood her to be saying. It's complicated to apply. Um, because with these soft letters, I'm not sure that's enough to apply for the state historic credits or not. I think that's something we have to look at. Okay. So. All right. So you're not ready for us to do anything. Okay. Good. Thank you. But do you want to take up the fund? Uh, let's see. Uh, you, you've got which issues? You got the uh, ZBA issues. Well, change, uh, change orders. Change orders. Oh, the change orders. Okay. Funds. Yep. All right. Steve, do you want to address the change order issues? Um, I, I don't really have a presentation per se we've submitted two requests I believe there's one for CBI uh, for their continuing uh, efforts in um, consensus building um, and then the second one is McCabe um, and it spells out in pretty much detail what um, the change order is all about I mean they have been uh, attending more meetings than they planned and attending with more staff than they had planned um, but they haven't charged us for that but going forward they have asked for compensation for the additional staff for our meetings our, our schedule as you know has been uh, prolonged a bit so um, there's more work to be done and there's been a little more intense work on the financials than they anticipated and so several other meetings that we've asked them to attend and prepare for that weren't part of their original scope so um, so that's the purpose of their change order uh, if there are any questions about them, I'm happy to answer them we're still under uh, Christine, we're still under the 25%, is it, um, that we can do without rebidding the, uh, the contract. Um, so the committee voted at our last meeting uh, to recommend to you uh, to approve the change order for the additional services. So how much is left under the contract? Sure. Um, there's a couple of things. There's the McCabe contract has phase one and phase two, and that was contracted for $120,000. we have spent... Uh, Ninety-five thousand five hundred. So there's twenty-five thousand left. Yeah. And it looks like at least some of her. And I didn't. I, I plan to call her. And I didn't just call her. Well, she, I, I realized afterwards she was out, out of the office. She said until tonight. So you probably wouldn't. Yeah. Be able I to tried to call her and she was out of the office. And I couldn't reach her. Yes. Now that I hear that, I did try to call her actually many times. <laughs> um, no. Uh, but it looks like at least some of the dollars are, you know for past events, so the May 13th, the May meeting, 2017 yeah. meeting, are the rest of these all going Future. forward? And so, so they, their anticipation then is that it will be a total of $45,000 through some period of time? Right. Through the end of phase two. Through the end of, well. Which should bring you to town meeting. Town meeting. <clears throat> right. Right. Uh, so it's, it's, it's added. I mean, I, I, I guess my, my question on this is, I mean, I understand the extended time period, but it seems like a lot of this, just reading this letter, is driven by things in the past that she was asked to do that weren't part of the contract, as opposed to, well, the timeline's being extended, so now they have to come to more meetings. It seems like what they've done before already has been beyond what was in the contract. And so well, I think they, for a while they were kind of, they didn't want to submit a change order. I think they were just doing the extra amount, thinking that they would just cover it within their contract. But I think it, it's kind of thing that they reached a point where it was enough additional that they felt like they needed to. And so they've included a couple items that they've already done, and most of the items are prospective. But I think it was that kind of thing that they still have not charges for a number of things that they've, they were, they've already done. Um, but I think they reached the point where they really needed to... Uh, to increase the amount of the contract. And so I, I guess my, my general question would be, I mean, is, is did they underbid the contract or is the committee asking too much of her? 
I mean, it, it's always hard in this situation where you don't really know what's going to happen, what, what, how to bid a job like that. I mean, you could argue, well, it's, it, you know, the, the, it's a master plan, but it was a very detailed scope of work that was laid out. Um, there have been a few things that have taken us longer to deal with than we expected. So, and, and the timeline that she quoted was, we definitely have gone past the timeline that they put forth in the contract. So, um, so you know, part of it, if, if it had been, if it hadn't gotten extended and if we hadn't had a lot more work on the financials, then I would have said, well, just suck it up. And I think that's sort of how she felt about it. But I think at this point, it's reached a level of additional work that I wouldn't have contemplated when she signed the contract now. I don't think she should have. I mean, we're, we're a challenging group, but she sort of knew we were a challenging group when she went into it just from some of the history. Um, she says that very nicely in the, <laughs> yes. in the request. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, she, she made her views clear there. And yes. I, I guess my, my concern then is kind of going forward, right? I mean, if, if it's just another $20,000 through a March town meeting, right. total plan. That's the plan. Total plan. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but but heavy 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 action on the over coming in. Um, <laughs> the my concern is sort of who is going to take charge of managing this situation because it seems like the impression I get from reading this letter is that she's getting requests from multiple members of the right. committee independently. Right. right. And there's not a single kind of source of management for her. Um, yeah, well, this I, I, not being respectful to her, but also just generally, right? I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it seems like this is a pretty substantial contract that, uh, on some level, particularly if it's going to go beyond this year, beyond March, that that process has to improve. I think somebody has to be in a position, whether it's you or Sarah or Christine, somebody has to be in a position to say, no, you can't ask McCabe to do this. Yeah, well, I, 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 you want this done, you've got to do it yourself, or this is not what we came to right. do it. Right? Well, I think it's both sides of the, of the coin, and so that's a conversation I had with her when this came in, and I said, you know, you, you need to now realize that if somebody's calling you up, I mean, I want her to be responsive to the committee as well, but if it's going to add costs, that she's got to talk to me about it before she does it. And so I think we have an understanding now that any additional work that a subcommittee asks her to do or a member of the committee asks her to do, she needs to run it by me if it's going to result in any kind of increase to the contract. So I think she's on board with that, and I need to have that same conversation with the committee. I think I've, we, we've had, you know, be, beaten around the bush a little bit, but I think I need to be more explicit with the committee that that's got to be the rule going forward, because uh, otherwise it's really impossible to, to keep a hold of the, of the reins here and make sure that she's only doing what she's supposed to do, or that if she is going to do more, that we know about it and know it in advance. Sort of keeping your focus on the task that the whole committee really wanted to do, as opposed Correct. to individual members of the committee. They wanted to do it. Other, you know, other things. Obviously, this involves communications with, with people outside of the committee as well. Okay, if I could throw a comment in, in, in fairness, for you, if there's any doubt, I don't think that uh, McCabe has been sloughing off in this thing. They, she really has had two. People, you know, she brings uh, one of her one of her associates, Jen, to virtually every meeting. I, I think when this contract was first being discussed on who to let it to, in those very earliest discussions, it was like, well, will you have a representative at e at each or most of our meetings? So the standard in terms of the expressed desire was like, well, can you make mo can you get one person to make most of the meetings? She's had to make both, and uh, the it's a very complex process, and this committee has been working under a very tight time frame to finish this up. It's been it's taken three years to get here, almost three years, but over the past, since the spring, uh, the various, even though the dates for this time meeting have been stretching out, uh, I think Kathy in many ways has felt the pressure of, of processing this. And the one observation I'd make is, if you had simply told her, no, sorry, but you know, your level of effort is make three out of four meetings, I don't think we would yet have the comprehensive grasp of the costs and the, and the details that she's been able to pull, the, in the detailed assessment of each of the buildings to even know kind of the bigger than a bread box, smaller than a barn kind of issues that the committee's dealing with. So the consequence would have been the committee basically not being prepared at all for anything where at least here we're talking about March. I do think the key here, assuming that that would carry her out to March, is that 
this is not just business as usual after that. It's got to, it's, we kind of, I'm guessing you'd be happy to be able to close this chapter of your life. And so there's, you know, this needs to be understood as something that it's like, this is, we're getting to a hard stop here. Uh, and if this is going to make the difference, then that's great. So do we want to have a motion then to, uh, let's see. Uh, sh sure. Sure. Um, you know, I would move that we uh, approve the change order request that's set forth in the McCabe letter. Second. And also the Consensus Building Institute, or not? The yeah, has one as well. Did they have a one? Yep. Yep. More meetings. There, there's just definitely a longer uh, issue, not a past issue. Right. Probably both of them separately. All, uh, any further discussion about the McCabe change order? All in favor? Aye. Yep. And then we need a motion on the uh, CBI change order. I, I would move to support the CBI change order as well. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Yep. Aye. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Do um, you want to talk to us about your ZBA or? Sure. <laughs> Why not? I'm here. You're half um, hours that up yet, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the zoning board um, met last week and, and voted to recommend two uh, new appointments. Um, we, we had some expression of interest by both of these gentlemen earlier in the year, um, and we actually had each of them attend a, a meeting, and we, we and talked with them and, and sort of learned about their background, answered questions, et cetera. Um, since then, we've actually had another member um, has announced, Re Rebecca has announced that she also is resigning, so now we have two spots open. So we were in a position of trying to figure out how we were going to choose between the two candidates, but now that we have um, her um, also resigning, we have two spots open. At the same time, um, <laughs> Doug has, an, has um, purchased a house in Florida, and he's going to be splitting his time back and forth, and he's been a full member. So he has said that he would rather, he was actually tentatively going to resign, but um, since there are already two spots open, um, he agreed to stay on as an associate member rather than a full member. And Jack McNicholas is willing to become a full member, so this is like a little bit of, re, you know, rearranging the chairs here on the deck, but, um, but at least um, Doug has resigned as a full member, and we would ask that you appoint him as an associate member, that you appoint Jack McNicholas as a full member, and that you appoint the two new gentlemen as associate members, so. Do we have a motion to that effect? Yes, and I, I would just say, I saw that Michael Witcher had applied to be the board of the Court of Laws and Trust as well, mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad that. And that's how we found out about him, and we said, you know, would you be interested in zoning instead, and he was intrigued by it. And yeah, so that, that's, that's great, they look really well qualified, and obviously as well. So yeah, I would move that we appoint uh, Jack McNichols as a full member, and Douglas Moyer, Boyer, William McNiff, and Michael Witcher as associate members. So does that cover all the things that you asked us yes. to decide? <laughs> it does. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Yep. Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much. Uh, let's see. We've got, uh, we never voted the SALT. Uh, we so voted CBI. We voted for CBI. No, SALT. Sorry. SALT. SALT. So I would vote that we vote to award the bid for joint SALT for 2017-18 Eastern Minerals in the amounts of, as stated in the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yep. Uh, I also move that we both sign the Chapter 9 reimbursement request for Main Street and Rose Street, paving the amount of $38,024.42. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yep. You're training us well, Pete. You don't need yes. to yeah. <laughs> yeah. sign a letter for support for uh, Robert Borelli's lip project at 71 North Street. I would move that we both sign a letter for support for Robert Borelli's lip project at 71 North Street. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yep. Uh, vote to award 2018 rates for MedEx. Two and Blue Med RX. Additionally, vote to authorize Town Administrator Michael Sullivan to sign acceptance form. Uh, so moved. Any comments from the mic? Anything we? Anything? It looked like an obvious good thing to do. I'm sorry. The <laughs> MedX two rates. MedX and uh, Blue. Yeah, uh, the committee met last week, the Insurance Advisory Committee, and unanimously recommended it, a very low increase, 1.68. So. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yep. And then, uh, let's see, license and permits consent agenda. I would move that we approve the items that set forth in the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Uh, yep. Uh, pending, selectman calendar. 
Anything there? The only thing I would say is that I think we have agreed, and, and I had corresponded with Jeremy Marset about the water and sewer board, and then come in on number seven. Yeah. Know, yeah. I believe that we'll use that on the calendar. And your next yeah, meeting. Um, is a, I'm sorry, I didn't give you send it out to you. The, uh, next meeting, you will have the. Uh, uh, Jerry McCarth McCarty will be here, and he will have his capital 20-year capital plan. I spoke to him yesterday, and he said he tried to get it out to you a few days early okay. so you'd have a chance to review it. Uh, the, we've also are hoping to have the permanent building committee and the energy committee here because they're all kind of related in terms of what they're uh, working towards. So. Um, you should have, and, and Chris, I don't know if, if uh, we should invite the Capital Budget Committee as well, I would think. Sure. Um, so w we are kind of moving towards a consensus. Uh, you know, you, you heard tonight uh, with Mo with the pavement management plan, you're going to have the Capital Budget Plan, which will be folded into the Capital Budget. Um, so we're starting to get to where I think you people wanted to be in terms of your decision making process where you have all the facts yeah, even if you don't it. want them all you know, you'll have pretty much everything in terms of what the town's financial position is and and how much we can afford and how much we can't afford okay uh, anything on the state hospital master plan Committee no, guidance or should that we, we didn't need to well yeah there is one thing but actually what should have been on was also the town goals and I'll cover that if you, if you let me at the Go same ahead. time sure please uh, so the the uh, state hospital master planning committee has gotten the guidance so that's actually an issue that's done uh, however was there any reaction to the guidance appreciation yeah yeah um, okay. yeah I actually the follow the I think the committee is happy to get whatever guidance the selectmen can provide it and uh and, yeah the the uh the comments i think bill and dave i think i didn't hear anybody gnashing their teeth we, they were glad to get the guidance that made it clear and that was that was good back uh but yeah yeah but in our process of going from my original draft to the final version the one thing that we cut out was i had not, I wasn't trying to force anything, but I had speculated that when the master planning committee was done, there would be a master development committee that would be formed to actually carry out the project. And we actually deleted that because you'd said, well, the selectmen never really have decided that. So I just want to put on the table that we have a job to do to figure out what the plan is post special town meeting. And we probably don't want to wait until March to figure that out. So I just would put that on as something that we need to start thinking about. Um, the only don't 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 think unless you want to talk about it that we need to spend any time discussing the town goals. But if you recall in the last meeting, we talked about wanting to come up with a, a version of the town goals that we had without the short-term goals uh, that we could actually float out to the public just to get their reactions. Uh, and I had offered to just simply reformat the, the draft we've been working on to drop that right-hand column to get to this. I did that, and then once I had it there, which was just a straight mechanical reformat, I then turned track changes on, and I went through the long-term goals, just trying to just trying to put my thoughts down for what we might do to up, you know, to fill in goals or improve them. So, what I'm passing out to you is a version. You can send one to Mike and uh, Mark as well. But the stuff that you see that's revised there, that was just my ideas. Um, to be honest, those are my ideas. It came out about 6 p.m. this afternoon as I was trying to get stuff pumped out of the printer time to bring this up to you. So. Is there a copy for everyone? For the yeah, I've got, I've got two. We're doing one. it. Maybe you're like this. I guess I have one extra one. I'm probably in my So I, let's just not talk about it tonight, but this is the this was at least my attempt to take the next step forward on what we had sent out to the public. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Annual appointments. Just is on our list here, Chris. Well, can we do that another should, night? Everybody should have received the annual appointments. I sent them. Yeah. Do you want to do okay. them tonight, or can we do them another night? 
I would never <laughs> want to do them. <laughs> we can put them off. But we can put them off for a week. Um, what I'll do is I'll send you a new draft. I'll make the changes we just did to the zoning board. And I actually talked to the Midfield Energy Committee, and they had a few changes they wanted to make as well. So I'll highlight those changes and get send you a new draft. Okay. Uh, Let's see here. Are we not voting on the minutes there? You had sent out uh, two weeks, two meetings worth of minutes. Yeah, they're so coming up. We haven't got there. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I need my half hour. <laughs> uh, veteran service officer, letter received from Council on Aging, objecting to, uh, to uh, bundling their social work position with the uh, veteran service officer. Um, well, the letter took a little bit of a turn halfway through. It was kind of a twist from the start, but um. I did based on the recommendation uh, that two of you made. I did forward the job <coughs> posting for the outreach worker at Council on Aging and the Veteran Services uh, Officer to the BC Social Work School, um, and they have posted it there. So I'm going to give it a week or two, see if we get any response, and other than that, we'll start interviewing the candidates that have already applied for it. So I, I did call uh, Roberta because she had singled me out in the letter as uh, objecting to uh, what I had proposed. And, and she basically wants to have the person in the building. And her objection was that she thought that if I was suggesting to her, gee, you're going to end up with a one and a half full-time equivalents in your, and she thought that the half was going to be at the town hall. And so that she didn't like, that didn't work for her to have the person out of the, her building. She'd be happy with two full-time positions. Tonight. Yes, she did propose but, I mean, that. But is there any reason, I mean, under the statute, the way it's drafted, that, that the person couldn't report to her and work in her building? I assume that's what the person would do. I yeah, thought that's but, what they would do, too. Well, they'd have to be a veteran, <laughs> first of all. No, no, I know. <coughs> Obviously, they have to be a veteran. We all know they have to be a veteran. Franklin's is at the Franklin season. But is there any reason under the statute that a veteran hired for that position, since most of his or her work will be in the council of aging side of it, couldn't be at the Council of Aging and reporting to Roberta. I'm, I'm going to recommend. I'm going to recommend we invite Roberta to have this discussion. Mm -hmm. That's part of what the prompt of the letter is that nobody is asking her in a public forum. So I think we really should ask Roberta. To okay. Sorry, Ron, just, from yep. your perspective, yep. from a VSO perspective, before we talk to Roberta, you can you use the microphone? Any reasons please? that's not allowed? Thank you. Not that I'm aware of. In fact, the town of Franklin, as Mark has said, you know, for years is had a dual position for veteran service office outreach worker. Well, can Roberta come next time? I will text her right now. Can we have a special <laughs> board of selectmen working meeting at the council on aging at 845 <laughs> I'll be there at 9 to 10 on Friday. But, but obviously in that case, Christy, we'll, we'll talk to Roberta. Right, she I just don't want to. She'd have to be involved in interviewing this person. <laughs> She, she has some, some very definitive ideas how the position should be. I had some definitive ideas about how the position should be. I'm and sure. I'm sure. All right. We'll um, cross that one off. We've solved that yeah. problem. Uh, next, we have uh, Mike, a town administrator update. Discuss requests from town of Sudbury for Medfield support for their campaign to run for a Yeah, this is a transportation uh, council oh. that uh, made up of cities and towns, and they're from so north they're and south. Planning council, right? It, it's part of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Those are transportation. Those are, those are the folks that were consulting. We, we've got them consulting with us. It's, it's primarily transportation, is my understanding of what they do, and they have elections every couple of years. They were um, the, that's the group that helped us with the uh, uh, omnibus contract, um, or is it different? Different. It's a different uh, organization. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And basically, in order to get put on the ballot, they need recommendations from five chief elected officials in their region. And Sudbury is asking the chief elected official in Midfield to um, vote to uh, support their candidacy so they can get on the ballot. Where do they stand on the craft train? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask that we have done. <laughs> have they taken a position in North Korea? Do you know what <laughs> Do we usually do this? Is this something that is a thing that we do? I can't remember the last time yes. we've done this. We could ask him to support our nomination for Amazon headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> is there any reason why we wouldn't support them? Well, I, I can't think of any reason why we wouldn't support them. I guess the question is why aren't we running? Yeah. No one else has asked. So. <laughs> right. We don't Nothing want to feel left out. It's pretty far away. Yeah. 
they probably can't hurt us from way over there. I don't know. I mean, we, we participate in the, the Metro West Managers Group with them. That's kind of our little subset of the MMA, so. They're nice people. They're very nice people. So do we care? Should we support them? I'm willing to support it. Might as well support them unless we want to be sure. there. Yeah. Yep. Do sure. we? Is this? I move that we support the town of Sudbury's. Second. All in favor. Yep. Aye. Aye. And it sounds like they need three letters, though, one from each one of us, right? <laughs> well, that, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, no, Should we vote back. on those letters separately? <laughs> I, take, I take it back if we have to write letters. Mitchell has been awarded a $7,200 grant from the Sustainable Materials Program. All right. Uh, status of OPEB, <coughs> review estimated revenues and debt. Oh, that's good. Can I back us up? Just, I, I'm not insisting on three letters, but is there any action that we, now that we voted and said we support them, what needs to happen? On, on the 7200 I, I think they actually yeah. sent us a letter that you were going to sign, okay. correct, from Sudbury? Okay. Um, that's the one last year they were going to apply towards a trailer, another trailer, air trailer for the transfer station. And oh. the Capital Budget Committee yeah, turned them down. Yeah, we're on, we're on two different pages. <laughs> it's after 10.30. All bets are off, people. <laughs> we signed one of these last year for to get a trailer? <laughs> keep going, keep going. So. Well, we're down to OPEB, status of OPEB. Is that what you just handed out, Mike? Yeah, that's what I handed out. And you've, I've set, we, uh, I believe Evelyn sent you all the OPEB report that's electronically. Right. Uh, our liability dropped from 47 to 44 million, plus we have 1.6 million as of June 30th set aside, so that reduced it to 42 million roughly. Uh, since then, we've added another million dollars, so. We currently have 2.6 million as the town's share of uh, long-term funding. Uh, I believe the results were about 10.2 percent for the first year that we belonged to OPEB. It's not quite as good as it sounds because a lot of that is unrealized gains, and they could disappear. But generally, I'd say <coughs> the uh, decision to put the money in in PRID has been a very good one. Mr. Chair, Mr. Trustee, Chief Chief Trustee, yes, we, we, it's, which we need to, we should have a meeting to kind yes, of take we should. Yeah. yeah. So just on this, Pete, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this issue um, since we got this report, and this is a bigger topic than we can cover at 10:35. Right. But you know, given the trend of this and what's happening in other cities and towns, other state governments. That, that I think the bond markets are starting to wake up to this somewhat um, as more and more cities are starting to look at potential bankruptcies um, and states are facing major liabilities. I, I don't think the sort of the continued approach of kind of everyone pretending that this is going to work out is necessarily going to be appropriate right now. We're, we're putting money aside, um, but we're, we're not on a schedule towards full funding. And right. so. I think we have to start to talk about it, and this is a larger discussion, which should probably include the Warren Committee. I mean, I think we have to start to talk about how we transition to including these costs in departmental budgets. Because the reality is that, that, that as long as, and, and we don't have an answer on it yet, but as long as we're going to provide these benefits, I think we need to get a better understanding of the extent to which we're required to provide them and, and kind of what the process would be to make that a point of negotiation as opposed to something that's simply kind of presumed at the moment. Um, I think we have to start talking about, not for historic costs. Historic costs sort of have to be dealt with in one bucket. So, so already the, the liability we've already accrued mm -hmm. is one bucket. Um, but for go going forward, I mean, as I read this report, we're racking up an extra $3 million a year in yeah. going forward liabilities by continuing to promise these benefits and not funding them. So I think you know, the actual cost of, of our employees at the moment includes what we have on the budget plus $3 million. Um, and I, I think we have to, to start to move in a direction of accurately reflecting that fact kind of in our departmental budgets and in compensation discussions with employees and trying to understand as, uh, as long as this is going to be something that we're going to offer. I'm not saying we shouldn't offer it. But if we're going to offer it, I don't think it's responsible to offer it without paying for it. Because then it really is just adding liabilities on future taxpayers in that field 
Um, and who knows if, if you get a couple of more bankruptcies, you suddenly, the market could suddenly get very slowed about this sort of thing. And you know, while we have a very good bond rating, we've got you know, a good tax base. It's a small tax base. And if at some point you know we have to fund a good chunk of that at once, um, that's not going to be pretty. And, and with any of these kinds of longer-term financial commitments. It's always easier the sooner you course correct, right? Well, yeah, so <clears throat> I agree with the basic idea that we should find ways to contribute more per year, but I would, it's taken me a couple of years to kind of get my arms wrapped around the, the mathematics of OPEB. Uh, and it would, this isn't the night to try to do it from memory and do it here, but the, the way that the system works, we, because we are not in full compliance, have a set of numbers that looks more dire than if we were in full compliance, the actuaries would use different things. Just to give you one example, right. Right. this is calculate, this is cal well, it's discount rate, but it's also a full funding up 24 years now, I think is where we're at, or 25 years. But if you were fully funded, they would be continuing to do it every for out of 30 years. So it's you're comparing a 25 year mortgage with a 30 year mortgage. It's okay. You just need to understand the math, the math before you take an action. And there, the other piece is to recognize that the way it works, we are still paying as we go. So when you look at the oh, we're only putting four hundred thousand toward OPEB, it's like well, four hundred thousand toward OPEB long-term financing of long-term benefits, along with another one point four or five million to actually pay benefits that are due this year that are included in what the actuaries use to calculate what we owe. So it's a one year, if I understand this right, it's a one year lag. You pay it this year, but it doesn't get recognized in the equation until the following year. So it's kind of like you have to understand the math in order to actually understand the target that probably is the responsible target. Right. Well, I, the, I, other, I, the other thing- That is, math you just described, I understand. Okay. Right. So it, it maybe it's not three the, million. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's two point five. It's only two. Right. It's not zero. Then the other it's thing. Hundred thousand dollars. Right. right. So right. whatever the number is that we think is the real number, we're accruing each year right. in respect of those benefits that every year we're promising to our employees that we're going to pay. Right. And that presumably um, we can be forced by a court to pay in the future, whether we have the money or not. That's the number we should be including in our departmental budgets as an expense of employing those employees. The, well, certainly when you're thinking about new employees and things like that, that, that cost should show up in the calculus. <clears throat> in thinking about the calculus of existing employees. In thinking about what to do about it to solve the problem, there are other alternatives like what Wellesley did. Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually, if we get to the point where we have a commitment that we want to do whatever it is we want to do in whatever time, time frame we want to do it, there's yet another question around what's the best strategy for getting there. Mm -hmm. Did Wellesley just bond it or what did yeah. they do? Wellesley bond it. Think about it. As soon as you do that, you suddenly get the 7% return from the actuaries. You get the 30 year. So the amount you would have to actually borrow is less than the amount that we're being told we have to pay in. Right. But, no, they, but not, then they're locked in. But then they're locked in on the debt. I think the audit asked that you set a policy on how you're going to fund it. And mm -hmm. so maybe that's something the trustees so ought to put yeah. on the agenda for the discussion of their meeting. And I don't mean to give you nightmares at this time of night, but I've been working with Martha Fester, and I saw this article, and it was very pertinent to what she's trying to do in terms of long-term obligations. And but I, I think I think it, I'm, all I'm saying is I, I'm not saying that this is an, an answer. Is I'm not arguing with you on the point. That we've got to have a discussion. It's got to include the warrant committee. It's got to include right. the school committee because the majority of the people here are, are collectively bargaining employees. Right. And so we've got to factor all of that in. But uh, one way or the other, we either have to say you know, whatever the number is, we're going to start funding it. And, and again, the sooner you do it, the easier it is. And if you say we're going to we're going to add 25 percent of the cost of the year for, for the next four years, and four years from now we make a full contribution, that could work. There's a lot of things that could work, but I, I think we can't. Um, I think that the, the rules and the bond markets are only going to get stricter on this going forward, and not more lines. So, Mike Sullivan, I. Heard you say earlier tonight, 57 million is what we owe between the OPEB and, and pensions. I thought that the, the pensions weren't that much. Yeah, it's uh, 42 million for um, OPEB. Uh, for OPEB and 18 million for Norfolk County. Okay. It is that it, much. The, the state mm -hmm. funds the teachers' retirement pension 
um, so it, it doesn't charge us anything, but that would be probably another six to seven million a year if we had to pay that ourselves. And they are only funded at 52 uh, as of January 1st, 2016. They were, the Mass Teachers Retirement System was only funded at 52.2%, which is a very, very bad level. So when it comes to going to court, we're, we're in that, you know, the old joke about the bear chasing you. Can't run as fast as the bear, you only have to run faster than everybody else. We're running faster than a lot of other people, but we're yeah. not running faster than And people. the legislature put us in this bind with all these early retirement programs. They were one of the main, and binding arbitration. That's what caused all these uh, enormous mm -hmm. uh, cost increases. But it also puts me to mind, Gus, though, comment um, of a now prominent politician back when he was in business that, you know, if you owe the bank $10,000 and you can't pay, that's your problem. If you owe the bank a billion dollars and you can't pay, that's the bank's problem. <laughs> and so, <laughs> <laughs> the smaller fish. So your point is cut back on the 400,000? Well, <laughs> well, no, the, the, the smaller fish are the ones that will get hammered because the bigger ones, they'll have to find a way to keep pretending and, and not actually fix it. So, yeah. if, if they're going to make an example of somebody, they're going to make an example of a small town, not the yeah. cigars, but not the state of Illinois. So. So uh, on our minutes, August uh, 15 and September 5th, both into the... I had, I had, I had well, you guys, I, I thought you guys would have corrections, because my corrections had to do with what you guys said. So I had, I had two, I had one correction on the August 15th meet, meeting. Uh, the second entry from the bottom, Selectman Marcucci remarked, and so I believe what I said, or what I should have said, but I think what I said was that uh, if the plan is adopted at the special town meeting, then it will be up to the Board of Selectmen to determine how the process will go from there and the composition of any committee to oversee the process. If I can give you this, Evelyn. There was, there was some side comment you made after that about, you know, and then this committee, if some members, you know, they'll decide whether or not they want to be on. But it was, the way it was written sounded like that committee would decide whether they were going to continue. I think you were making the point if there was anybody from that committee that was a suitable candidate for the next committee, then they'd have to decide whether they wanted more right. punishment or not. Right. Okay. So does my correction fit with your recollection? That's correct. Okay. Yep. So that's, that was one. My change was that uh, uh, something that Gus said was attributed to me, but. More, yeah, well, I, no, actually, I think what happened is I, in the draft, had it's, it's made the prediction that a master development committee would be formed after the master planning committee had completed. And Pete basically made the point that no decision had been made. So you made it sound like Pete said the decision had been made to create the master development committee, when in fact Pete pointed out that there was no decision to create a master development. Mm -hmm. So it said the opposite one. There was a third one on that, <coughs> on that and I, for some reason I left that at home, but there was a third one. There was a third, there was a third thing that was wrong. Well, I have one more correction just to add. I, I think under the licenses and permits consent agenda, we should just copy and list them all that we approved, just so that they're yeah. in the minutes. Yep. So that people don't have to go back and look at the, right. because the minutes and the agenda mm -hmm. don't always appear in the same document. Yeah. Yeah. And so we just copy them, we, we approved all the license and permits as followed. Yep. Just listen. I printed okay. it out, marked it up, and then I didn't pull it off oh, my yeah. desk. So what, maybe we defer on that one, because sure, I know there's a third thing. On, on the other one, um, it's not pickleboard, it's pickleball. <laughs> on the other one, it's... I, yeah, I, I was surprised. I what thought context were we talking about? <laughs> the meeting minutes. So the other, the, the other one that you had, the September. No, I know. I'm, 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 what context of our meeting were we talking about pickleball? Uh, we were, I think we were talking about the amendment, the, you know, the two loan documents that we signed for the King's Great Club. Okay. The They're purpose of the expansion pickleball. was to put in, in pickleball. a pickleball. I'm looking forward to seeing what pickleball pickle looks like. <laughs> I, I was surprised when I read the Park and Rec report because we were told that pickleball was for seniors, but in the Park and Rec report it said pickleball is very popular with kids. Mm. So, mm. Mm. Selectman reports, Mr. Oh, Mark, oh sorry. my gosh, oh. this is a correction <laughs> on the September 5th, 2017 oh, meeting under Selectman's reports. Um, it's just that the committee will be meeting with the Housing Authority to learn more about the project to add more units at Tilden Village. Just so it's clear that is it, is Do you have that on there? Yep, I'll give it to you. Good. Yep. Okay, uh, selectman's reports, Mr. Marcucci. Uh, it's 1049, and I pass. 
Mr. Only thing, the only Absolutely. report I have, the only report I have, and I'm glad these two gentlemen stayed here. Uh, but the ALS study team had another meeting last week, uh, and we actually, I think, if, if uh, are on the verge of a of an encouraging breakthrough. I won't I won't lay out all the details yet, but it looks like we may have a path, which uh, the committee fundamentally agreed with, which would make the financial side of it much more palatable, but also would put us on a course that I think could get us to a good spot. So I would say, and the reason I put it that way is, and I want to, I want to uh, it's good you two guys are here. There are times in this town when there are citizens who choose to just show up and pitch in, who are neither appointed nor elected, who do this town more good than the appointed or elected officials do, and there's times when you two have done that. Uh, in this particular case, Chief Hollingshead and Sean Kay, uh, they've, they've started to come to the meetings. Uh, both have been very invaluable. Uh, in Sean's case, he was one of the people who, who volunteered to be on this committee, and as you recall, we moved it from seven members to ten because we had so many good, but Sean was one person I underestimated what he brought to the table. Uh, he actually jumped up and facilitated a discussion at this meeting that pushed, crystallized some things that I was intending to hold off because I wasn't sure how well they would crystallize. Uh, and he got up there and basically facilitated a discussion and we probably saved ourselves a month and a half, a uh, month to a month and a half. So uh, just a point that there, one of the reasons this town works the way it is, doesn't have to do with appointed or elected people. It has a lot to do with the fact that citizens that when they see something that looks like they have an interest in or they, uh, even if they don't get selected for the committee they volunteer for, they still show up and contribute and uh, they, they deserve uh, recognition. So. Very good. Anything else? That's it. Okay, informational? No. Uh, the only thing is uh, there was a new system started of registering cars Monday where they take photographs and so anybody that hasn't registered their car lately might notice some changes. I spent three hours in the RV this morning and I have to go ahead, but you mean inspected, the new inspection system. Ooh, I car inspected. Um, so I'll find out, I'll report back at our next meeting how it goes. I, I had heard, I, I called uh, Medfield Automotive today and the system's been down for the last two days, so. <laughs> All over, all over the state system. All over the state. I was lucky I got my inspection sticker last Wednesday. <laughs> and Mike, I had two questions for you. Does the town own the Danielson Mill Dam? Yes. Oh, Danielson, yes. So that's why it came yes. out. Okay. Yes, that was given to us by the Ritchie family. Okay. So I call it Ritchie Pond, not Danielson okay. Pond. And the second question is, why do we want Route 27? What's the other? Uh, the, the abutters... Um, who are appealing the Conservation Commission decision on the vernal pool or the wetlands okay. issue. Yep. Uh, their lawyer has to give sent it, the road. So they sent it to the Mass DOT, and Mass DOT said, we don't own the road. So the oh. lawyer wanted proof as to who owned the road. Okay. And uh, Mark was able to, no, we went to the assess the assessors were able to take it out. Actually, they're going back to ConCon for the request of determination. Okay, so this is, a, and the reason I asked the question was to pick up responsibility for maintaining it when we own it, I assume. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's, it's an interesting point when people say, uh, the state is 27 and 109 are state roads, they're not, the right. town, right. they're town roads. Right. So. Okay. Mo said tonight that the state, the, the bridges were state bridges at one time. Maybe we should see if we can give them back. Uh, yes. Well, well, you know, when they, they come in and inspect you, you the when they come and inspect you and tell you, you have to fix them. When, when they talked about closing down the West Street Bridge, I said, "Good, let them do it." The Attorney it's, General it, has uh, promulgated uh, revised opening law regs, which are effective this Friday. Well, I like them. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, which oh, brings well, up, which we now brings actually just have to wear a wire 24 7. It's going to be a live feed of everything we say through the town website. My, my so, I, yes. I don't know if you've noticed the new board um, behind the town hall underneath the Menfield Townhouse sign. There is a new meeting posting board. So, we are moving the meeting notice board that's in the vestibule inside to outside so there's 24 7 access. 
media. One of the changes uh, in the open meeting lives you can now post online at your yes. website. However, but if you make that the primary site and it goes down, you can't be required screwed. to re-notice meeting. Yeah. Right. That could and with the, the, with the number of 40B projects we have being discussed, we did not want to have an issue where we have a new website coming right. in December 15th. We didn't want to have an issue of it going down and not having a uh, a legal meeting, oh, so meeting. we have we are going to move all the official posting to outside the town hall 24 7. So, the other two changes that I took note of was one that we should uh, uh, do a remote meetings so that when Gus and, and Mike travel, that they can still participate. Oh, well, they can't, you one of they can't all well, okay, one or the other because you still have to still be the right. quorum, right? Yep. And then the third thing is that the, the minutes have to be done within 30 days, and or and they suggest that the minutes should be done by the next meeting. So, and I think that we should try to make that a, a, our policy. Remote, uh, uh, you have within three meetings, participation has been all they did was change. well, we're within no three. You don't have to give a reason. There was enumerated reasons before. Yeah, now it's just that file on it. What? You do have to have a local. We don't have one, do we? No, I think we have put off doing it. Um, Previously. So we, we, I'm sorry, we have to have the bylaw before we can do it, is that? Right. You have to make a determination. Yeah, I think it makes sense to do for, I mean. I, I was at a meeting of town administrators uh, about a week and a half ago out in Sudbury and, um, one of the towns has had 251 public records requests and has spent another town has spent seventy thousand dollars putting together uh, you know answering public records requests uh, some of the towns are having to hire full-time people and by the way the legislature and the constitutional offices are exempt there's actually something about that in, in these changes too. It's after you go past yes. five, you can uh, you can ask yes. the AG to and intercede or something. And this, and he wouldn't. That's he left him out hanging. You know. So this is anybody that decides they want to get even with the local government can just plaster them with with requests for public records. I've had six. Yeah. <laughs> I move that we adjourn. Excellent. Thank you. Bye.